fellow stalkers and welcome to my channel. And this right here is my first and biggest project yet. This is the definitive stalker iceberg. The reason I call it that is that I have found several icebergs on the internet, you know, relating to stalker, but most of them were either too small or, in my opinion, incomplete. So, I decided that I would fuse every single one of them that I found into a single Giga Iceberg. I also added a lot of stuff that they originally did not have. Plus some theories I have about the lore and the world of Stalker. So, no more stalling, let's get into it. Prepare yourself for the definitive Stalker Iceberg. Tourist Tier Fresh-faced newcomer, completely new to the franchise and its lore. You haven't even entered the zone yet. So this tier is for you. It mostly serves as a way to kind of familiarize you with some of the basic concepts and, you know, the big players, the factions, and all the other basic information that you need to understand everything else in the iceberg. Stalker Stalker is a video game series created by GSC Game World. It is inspired by the science fiction book Roadside Picnic and its film adaptation Stalker. It is set in the Chernobyl exclusion zone where a second disaster has happened transforming the entire exclusion zone into what is now known as simply the zone or the zone of alienation. A strange and unnatural place where anomalies that defy our understanding of physics and reality are commonplace and deadly mutants roam the land. In the games, you play as a stalker, an individual that for one reason or another has entered the zone, either to make a profit from selling the artifacts that form there or to investigate its secrets. Stalker is also an acronym that means scavengers, trespassers, adventurers, loners, killers, explorers, and robbers. GSC Game World GSC Game World is the developer behind the Stalker series, founded in 1995 and is based in the city of Kiev. Their first game was a third person shooter called Codename Outbreak. And later on, they also developed the video game series Cossacks. On December 9, 2011, GSC was dissolved and subsequently, the original Stalker 2 was cancelled. Many employees, especially those who work on the Stalker series, formed two new studios and made new games that were inspired by their past work. Thankfully, in December 2014, GSC reopened and announced a new game in development. They have since then made Cossacks 3, a sequel to their other main long-running series, and have also restarted development on Stalker 2, now named Stalker 2 Heart of Chernobyl. Roadside Picnic Roadside Picnic is a 1971 science fiction novel written by Arkady and Boris Strugatsky, commonly known as the Strugatsky brothers, and it's the main source of literary inspiration for the Stalker series. The games borrow a great deal from the novels, to the point that they can be considered a loose adaptation. The names and abilities of many of the anomalies and artifacts are many times lifted straight from the novel. Even the name Stalker itself comes from the book, Originally, Stalker was supposed to be even more similar to the novel in many aspects, but as time went on, it became more original, so to speak. The Chernobyl Disaster The Chernobyl Disaster was a nuclear catastrophe that happened in Ukraine on 26th of April 1986. It was caused by a multitude of factors ranging from human error to design flaws in the reactor's design. And ironically enough, the test that caused the reactor to explode was a safety test. This test meant to measure the ability of the steam turbine to power the emergency feedwater pumps of a RBMK type nuclear reactor in the event of a simultaneous loss of external power and major coolant leak. During a planned decrease of reactor power in preparation for the test, the operators accidentally dropped power output to near zero, 
partially due to xenon poisoning, which is a gas that's used in this type of reactor, and it had accumulated inside of it. While recovering from the power drop and stabilizing the reactor, the operators removed a number of control rods. And upon test completion, the operators triggered a, re a reactor shutdown. But due to a design flaw, this action resulted in localized increases in reactivity within the reactor. This resulted in rupture of fuel channels, leading to a rapid decrease in pressure, which caused the coolant inside the reactor to immediately turn to steam. This decreased the neutron absorption, leading to an increase in reactor activity, which further increased coolant temperatures. This endless loop would eventually result in a giant steam explosion and the melting of the reactor core. In response to the incident, a 30 km exclusion zone has been put into place around the power plant. This area is highly radioactive and entrance is strictly forbidden. This area is the setting of the Stalker series, where it's now called the Zone of Alienation, or simply the Zone. However, differently from reality, the Zone of Alienation from the Stalker series is 60 km wide instead of 30, and it was set up around the nuclear power plant following the 1986 disaster, and it was extended by the second Chernobyl disaster in 2006. Loners Free stalkers, or loners as they are also called, make up the majority of stalkers in the zone. They are stalkers that are not aligned with any faction and instead they work independently as freelancers, doing whatever jobs they feel like doing for whoever they feel like doing. While the faction is not very organized and does not have a central leader, loners seem to have a strong sense of brotherhood, so attacking a loner will make other loners hostile. And again, while they do not possess a main leader, they do have small figureheads, you know, so to speak, that many loners rally around, such as Wolf and Fnatic in the Rookie Village and Beard in Zaton. Their main occupation in the zone is participating in the artifact trade. Loners risk their lives in the zone with the objective of locating and selling artifacts to enrich themselves. Loners have no standard equipment and thus come in all shapes and sizes when it comes to armament and suits, but they do tend to prefer Warsaw packed weapons. And while some only have leather jackets, the ones that do have suits mostly wear the Sunrise suit, or if they're more wealthy, they use things like the Seva suit or the Exoskeleton. Bandits Bandits are criminals and felons that have escaped into the zone to run away from the law. They mostly steal artifacts from stalkers and deal in weapons. They are hostile to practically everyone and are thus hated by almost all factions. They are a constant nuisance for loners and the two have been fighting each other basically since the beginning of the zone. Unlike the loners, the bandits actually try to keep a certain level of organized leadership with leaders such as Yoga, Borov, and later Sultan, but many bandits simply don't follow these leaders and instead act within their own gangs, setting up ambushes for stalkers and being basically the highwaymen of the zone. They are one of the most poorly equipped factions of the zone, usually relying on low-grade weaponry and very light armors. Traders Traders are the main buyers of artifacts in the zone. They are the ones responsible for setting up and organizing the artifact trade. And the two biggest and major traders in the zone are Sidorovich in the Cordon and Barman in Rostock. They also give out quests and contracts to the player. They are completely neutral in zone politics, with their only goal being profit. The Military the military, or more accurately, the security service of Ukraine, are the military arm of the Ukrainian government and follow its orders to contain the zone. They are made up of Ukrainian soldiers that have been sent into the zone to guard the perimeter and conduct operations within the zone. They are, in theory, supposed to stop the artifact trade and keep trespassers to a minimum, but in reality they are one of the most corrupt factions in the zone. 
constantly accepting bribes to turn a blind eye and not enforce their orders. And many times they sell equipment to traders such as grenades, ammo and even rifles that are then sold to stalkers. The military used to have a much larger presence in the zone, but after the second Great Emission, they lost their base in the army warehouses and now they mostly stick to the borders of the zone. The average grunt is equipped with a simple vest and standard issue AK-74M rifle. But the more specialized troops such as the Spatnaz have access to some of the best Warsaw packed weapons in the game. And some of the best suits too. Duty. Duty is a paramilitary faction of stalkers operating in the zone with members living according to a code. They are the rivals of freedom and are also one of the most powerful stalker clans in the zone. They are mostly made up of ex-soldiers that were left behind in the zone during the multiple failed military operations launched by the security service of Ukraine. The members of duty believe that the zone presents a mortal danger to all mankind and that it must be destroyed. They do not keep artifacts and don't engage in the artifact trade. Instead, they give all artifacts they find to the ecologists, and both factions have sort of a deal with each other. They are tolerant of loners and spend most of their time conducting raids against mutants, bandits, mercs, and anything else they see as either part of the zone or spreading its corruption. Because of this, they actually end up helping your average loner quite a lot because they clear mutants and etc. They are engaged in a bitter war with freedom, their ideological rival. By the time the first game begins, both factions are in a ceasefire agreement, and the main headquarters of the duty faction is the Rostock factory, an area seen by many as the de facto capital of the zone. Most duty members are equipped with light bulletproof vests and more effective Warsaw packed weapons, but they also have access to many exoskeleton suits and some of the best Warsaw gear in the game besides the Spatnaz. Freedom Freedom is a clan of anarchist stalkers who fight for free access to the zone. They believe the zone is a miracle to mankind and that it must be preserved as an autonomous zone free from government intervention. They are the bitter rival of duty who they see as dumb jarheads who only know how to pull the trigger. In opposition to duty's highly disciplined troops, freedom has more of a lax command structure and its members often partake of recreational drugs. They control the army warehouses and are also the ones defending the barrier against the monolith during Shadow of Chernobyl. In contrast to Duty, which uses mostly Warsaw Pact weapons, Freedom uses almost exclusively NATO or Western weapons, and in terms of suits, they have around the same amount of exos as Duty. And to be quite honest, both factions are quite similar when it comes to strength and power projection. Mercenaries the mercenaries are a group of private military contractors operating within the zone. No one knows who hired the mercs, but they seem to have very rich patrons as they possess high quality equipment and western weapons. Their true base of operations is unknown, hitting that it may be deep within the zone. They are one of the most secretive factions in the games, and many speak highly of their skills saying that the mercs can annihilate small groups of loners but that their services do not come cheap, demanding a so-called king's ransom in payment. They do not have a leader, instead there are many groups of mercs that s operate you know, semi-independently from each other. Most mercs are very well equipped, using almost exclusively western weapons and lightweight body armor, although there are some isolated cases of them using Warsaw Pact weapons. Their clients are most likely international research groups or corporations that wish to acquire either documents or artifacts from the zone through less than legal means. The Ecologists The Ecologists are government funded researchers sent into the zone with the objective of cataloging, studying and overall attempting to understand the zone and its artifacts. Differently from the most factions, the ecologists are not in the zone for profit or to destroy slash preserve the zone. They are instead just scientists, spending their days researching any artifact or mutant part that gets sold to them by stalkers. 
they also often require the assistance of loners, duties, or mercs to accomplish their assignments, as the ecologists aren't particularly experienced fighters. They possess two different HQs in the zone, in the form of two bunkers, one in Yantar and one in Jupiter, and their two de facto leaders are Professor Sakharov in Yantar and Professor Herman in Jupiter. They mostly stick to using SMGs and NATO rifles as their main armaments, and their suits are made specifically to endure the zone's anomalies and isolate them from any radionucleoids present, and are thus highly ineffective for combat, which is why, again, they often rely on stalkers for protection. Clear Sky Clear Sky is a scientific slash paramilitary organization whose main objective is somewhat similar to the ecologists in that they wish to understand the zone. But while the ecologists see the zone as just an anomaly to study, the Clear Sky faction see the zone as like a living entity that humanity has to learn how to live with and also how to make sure we don't piss it off. They are one of the first factions to be established in the zone and are neutral to almost everyone since they are not exactly interested in zone politics but mostly on containing and finding ways to live with the zone. Their leaders were scientists that were involved with the very experiments that spawned the zone. The faction started out as very weak having basic weaponry and only one major base which to be honest was a literal crack shack in the swamps. Like, I'm not trying to be mean to Clear Sky, but the faction was pretty ghetto at first. However, during the course of the game they appear in, they quickly become one of the strongest factions in the zone, possibly the second strongest in the entire area, since they basically fielded an entire army with good equipment by the end of the game. Unfortunately though, the faction ended in tragedy, but not to spoil Clear Sky, I'll leave it at that. Monolith a hostile religious cult that believe in the divine essence of the zone. The monolith are more of a cult than a normal faction, and are also the undisputed strongest faction in the zone, holding the CNPP, Pripyat, and the Desiree Hospital, making them the one with the most territory and the best equipment. They believe in a structure known as the monolith, a supposed alien life form within the CNPP, and that this monolith is their savior and guide who will bring some sort of salvation to mankind, and because of this they fanatically defend the north of the zone, not allowing anyone to reach the power plant. They are hostile to all, and because their brainwashing cannot be reasoned with, they are often the final enemy and main antagonistic force that the protagonist must face. The members of this faction are zombified, most likely by the brain scorcher, and thus function more like a hive mind, with no personality or individuality. They are highly organized and skilled fighters, fighting to the very last man and never under any circumstance surrendering. It is possible for monolith members to be able to overcome their brainwashing and return to normal, but this is very very rare, with only one case in the entire franchise. While the monoliths seem to follow only, well, the monolith itself, they do have some sort of chain of command, as in the games you can find several preachers that seem to lead the others in a squad, but overall the true nature of this faction is still left a complete mystery. Renegades The Renegades, or Dollar Store Bandits, are a loosely held together group of jackals, murderers and other scum that only respect force. The members of this group have such a horrible reputation that all factions except for bandits in freedom aka bandits in uniform refuse to openly associate with them. Because of this the renegades are hostile to practically everyone. Their equipment is bare bones, using only basic SMGs and some AKs, and the only suit of quality they have is a modified mercenary suit, which is known in the fandom as a sunset suit, but canonically it's never named. They did have at least one well-equipped expert squad that fought in Le Mans, but that's about it. They also possess no named leader. The faction was either wiped out or dissolved after Clear Sky, as they're never mentioned again afterwards. I have a small headcanon about this faction, see I like to believe that they're the ones who invented the bandit mercenary suit that appears in all games. The reason I believe this is because unlike the bandits, 
the renegades are enemies with the mercs, so they most likely scavenge the merc suits off of their dead opponents and modify them for their own use. And after the death of the faction, the remnants most likely got absorbed by the bandits. Which is why the bandit faction got possession of this suit in the other games. Again, I have no evidence for this, but it's just a headcanon of mine. There is evidence, however, to indicate that the Renegades are a modified version of a cut faction that we will talk about later, so stay tuned for that. Zombies The Zombies aren't really a faction, they're more of a state of being a stalker can find himself in if they stay too long under the effects of a Psyometer. Zombified Stalkers are, as the name implies, Brain damaged stalkers that have lost the most cognitive functions, behaving in a more animal-like way. They are hostile to almost everyone. They however still have some levels of brain function, as they are still capable of using firearms. Not very well, mind you, mostly just hip firing in the general direction of threats, but still. This shows they must have some small level of brain function left. Weirdly enough, the only people they don't attack are monolithians. The zombified stalkers can come from any faction, loners, bandits, mercs, soldiers, they can all be zombified, and thus zombie stalkers have a completely random loadout, from SMGs to pistols to rifles, they are complete wild cards when it comes to gear. Anomalies Anomalies are, in basic terms, cracks in our reality in which the laws of physics become mere suggestions. These cracks showed up after the second disaster and are the main non-physical obstacle in your path. Anomalies come in many you know, different shapes and sizes, some are gravitational while others are chemical based or fire based, but they're also the ones responsible for generating the artifacts, which is one of the reasons artifact hunting is so dangerous, as to locate the artifact one must enter anomalous fields. They can be spotted either by throwing bolts, using a detector or just having a keen eye and learning how to spot the anomalies by some telltale signs they have. Overall, anomalies are a constant threat for every stalker and learning how to avoid them is paramount to survival. Artifacts Artifacts are anomalous objects or formations that possess certain abilities and characteristics. They are the main source of income for stalkers and the reason that many come to the zone in the first place. Artifacts are the byproducts of anomalies and they possess supernatural abilities, granting the user protection from certain types of damage, making them able to carry more stuff or even regenerate wounds. Artifacts are extremely valuable, with even low tier artifacts capable of being sold to the right people for a very good price. They have changed slightly throughout the series, originally they were visible to the naked eye, but in other installments a detector is required to locate them. There are again some theories that try to explain this, but those come later in the iceberg. Emissions Emissions are large energy releases coming from the very center of the zone. These outbursts of psi energy expand from the center and spread out covering the entire zone. During this time, staying outside is deadly as the massive psi energy will kill anyone outside of shelter. They used to be much rarer, only happening a couple of times in the history of the zone. However, they became more and more regular after Shadow of Chernobyl, happening almost every week it seems. Fortunately, these frequent emissions are much weaker, as simple shelters are capable of protecting stalkers from them, unlike the original rare emissions that were far more deadly. Rookie Tier you have spent some time in the zone, but you never strayed too far from the rookie village. You're not confident enough to venture further, so you stay in the corridor, acquiring the skills and experience necessary to survive. Your level of information is basic, but definitely better than a tourist. X Labs The X Labs are underground laboratories in the zone that research psi fields and their effects on living beings. They are the quote-unquote dungeons of the Stalker series. Exploring these extremely dangerous areas is mandatory for progression and also to further your understanding of the zone, as the documents found inside shed new light upon many of its mysteries. 
In these areas, the horror element of Stalker really shines, as being deep underground while facing some of the most dangerous mutants in the dark tunnels of an abandoned Soviet lab is a truly unique experience. Now, to be honest, this is a very uh, kind of a setup entry in the sense that it's just supposed to give you a basic overview of the concept. Later on in the iceberg, we will get into more specific labs and the experiments that happen within them. Also, about who was responsible for conducting them in the first place. So just keeping this in mind, X labs, you know, underground laboratories in the zone, keep the concept in your head for later. Wolf. Wolf is an experienced stalker that has, alongside his second-in-command, Fnatic, dedicated himself to mentoring and protecting the rookie stalkers in the Corridon, defending the village from bandits or mercs and also organizing the rookies into a more cohesive force. He appears in two of the three games, always as the warden of the rookie village. Unknown to most people, Wolf actually has a brother, but we'll talk more about him later on, but just keep him in mind. Wolf's Dynamite In the beginning of the game, Wolf will spend all his time guarding the rookie village, but after you return from the Dark Valley after exploring the lab there, he's gone, and is instead replaced with his second-in-command Fnatic. But if you ask Fnatic about Wolf's disappearance, he simply tells you that a stalker delivered a message to Wolf, and after that, Wolf simply packed his fangs, took an entire crate of dynamite with him, and left for the north, leaving the village under the watch of Fnatic. But when we reach the army warehouses, who do we find? You guessed it, Wolf. And he's just chilling, you know, with some Zaza in a loner camp with no dynamite box to be found. While some may think this is the end and that Wolf's dynamite is simply left as a mystery, this is where a theory comes in. You see, when you enter the warehouses for the first time, you meet a rogue duty squad named Silence. They try to recruit you to help them destroy the Freedom Faction. And how do they plan to invade or destroy the Freedom Base? By blowing up the wall with a crate of dynamite. Leaving most people to believe that Wolf is the one that gave Skull, the duty squad leader, the dynamite. Which, to be fair, does fit with his lore, as Wolf does seem to have some sort of negative opinion of the Freedom Faction, even going so far as calling them Den Hippies in one of his dialogues. So him helping duty is not that far-fetched. Anomalous Dugout Anomalous Dugout is an awesome channel that's dedicated to covering and discussing Stalker lore. If you are in any way interested in knowing more about Stalker and the world around it, I highly recommend that you check it out. Many of the entries in this iceberg come from stuff that was talked about in his videos, or from the iceberg image that he created, which although very interesting, I felt was kind of lacking in content, so that's why I decided to make one myself. But seriously though, Go support him, subscribe to Anomalous Dugout, it's an awesome channel. Artifacts in Boxes This entry is in reference to the fact that the player can often find artifacts in breakable wooden boxes, but sometimes these artifacts in boxes are in areas they really shouldn't be. Like for example, there is artifacts that are inside a box in a sealed laboratory that you are like the first person to get in there bringing in the question as to how did these artifacts get in there in the first place. Artifact in boxes thing is used by some to potentially indicate that the scientists that originally created the zone may have survived for some time inside the labs after the second disaster. Strelux Group This unnamed group, simply referred to as Strelux Group, was a small squad of stalkers consisting of Ghost, Fang, Doctor, and maybe Guide, his membership in the grouping is not confirmed, and the leader being, obviously, Strelok, the legendary stalker. All members of the squad are legends in and out of themselves, and are responsible for many great feats such as being the first group to ever reach the center and return alive. They were trying to discover the truth of the zone, and they were very close, practically on the precipice of revelation before several events in the zone caused the group to eventually collapse, with the death of most of its members. Their mysterious leader, Strelok, is the man you are hunting down in Shadow of Chernobyl, and he is one of the most important stalkers in the zone, but more about him later. Guide Guide is a stalker considered by many to be the very first stalker to ever enter the zone. This can't be proven, however, and seems to just be a legend among stalkers due to his impressive abilities. Being described as capable of reaching any area in the zone and slipping past any anomalous field or enemy encampment with ease. 
To get the true ending to Shadow of Chernobyl, meeting Guide is mandatory as he's the one who reveals the Doctor's location to the player. While he does not appear in the other games, he is mentioned twice in Call of Pripyat as being the one who led the military survivors and later Strelok himself to the laundromat in Pripyat. Project Truth Project Truth is the name of an operation led by the security service of Ukraine in Indazon with the objective of uncovering the truth behind the Agropom Research Institute for Agriculture, aka Agroprom. See, the original purpose of the institute was to research agriculture in radiation-infected soil. However, the military find out that between 2005 to 2008, they never conducted any research relating to this. And instead, the entire institute was actually a giant front operation for the group. They used the institute to acquire some of the funds and equipment they needed to conduct the uh, real research into psychic fields and the noosphere. The Project Truth documents are the ones you steal from the military in Shadow of Chernobyl, and they are the ones who reveal the existence of Lab X-18 to the player. This is also why the military shows up in Lab X-18 after you collect the documents there. That's because they already knew of the lab's existence and were there to follow up on that lead. And coincidentally, they start the raid at the same time you were there. These documents also have uh, something quite interesting in them, is that they actually create a bit of a ludonarrative dissonance in the game. If you're wondering, ludonarrative dissonance is the disconnect between a game's narrative and the gameplay. So why do these documents cause a ludonarrative dissonance? Well, you see, the documents state that the investigation started on the 12th of the 5th, 2012 and ended on the 25th of the 5th, 2012. There's a bit of a problem with this, you see, Shadow of Chernobyl starts on the 1st of the 5th, 2012, so this investigation started 11 days after the game begins and ended 20 days after the game begins. And if you played Shadow of Chernobyl, you know that stealing the documents from the Institute is like the second major quest you take on, like even if you suck at Stalker, it should only take you at most for like 3 zone days for you to reach the Institute. So yeah, you can see there's a little bit of a problem here, like you steal the documents of this investigation before the investigation ends. This shows that the canonical timeline of events is not the same as the gameplay line of events. Canonically speaking, the Mark I took at least, at least 26 days to reach the Agroprom Institute most likely spending those days doing jobs for traders and preparing to go further into the zone. While in game you reach Agropon in like a matter of hours. So yeah, pretty interesting case of Ludo narrative dissonance right there. Fresh Zombies Fresh Zombies refers to certain stalkers that although they have been zombified, still move and act like regular stalkers. One example is the crazy freedom stalker in the army warehouses. This shows that the loss of cognitive functions may be a slower process than anticipated and that victims of psi fields maintain at least some level of higher brain power for at least the first minutes or hours after exposure. Stalker Rankings This entry refers to the ranking system which sadly only appears in Shadow of Chernobyl and it's basically a giant stalker scoreboard that's set up by Sidorovich that tracks the achievements and feats of all stalkers using a point system. However, this begs the question, is the scoreboard an actual effective way to show which stalker is the best? Because you have to keep in mind, this thing is run by Sid, and he only includes stalkers that he knows, so there may be more skilled stalkers out there that simply did not make the list. Scar Killed Fang this is in reference to the popular theory that may or may not be canon that states that the stalker responsible for the death of Fang, one of the members of Strelok's group, is Scar, the protagonist of Clear Sky. The evidence behind this is that obviously Scar is hunting down Strelok and his group in Clear Sky, and does it make sense that he would face off against Fang? Not only that, but the PDA message that Ghost sent to Strelok describing how Fang died says that the killer was an experienced stalker with a huge scar across his face wielding a VSS Vintar rifle. This is a perfect match for Scar, I mean, he has the motive and the killer matches his description almost perfectly, so why is this considered a theory and not fact? 
Well, you see, the problem is that, well, Clear Sky exists. I mean, in Clear Sky, we play as Scar and we never fight Fang, nor do we even see him, leading some to question if it was really Scar that killed Fang. To be honest, this is most likely cut content. You were probably meant to fight Fang in Clear Sky, but unfortunately, it was cut. However, I do have a little personal schizo theory of mine to try and explain how it could have been Scar, but not really. Look, you will see it later on the iceberg, trust me, it's pretty cool. Bridge Military In the cordon, there's a detachment of servicemen guarding the bridge that cuts the map in half. If you want, you can bribe them with 500 rubles to pass, or you can go through the tunnel anomaly for free instead, or, you know, Third option, you can just kill them all, which may seem like the preferable option, you know, just get rid of them and open the passage, but beware, if you do eliminate them, when you return to the corridor later, there will be some friendly faces, so to speak, waiting for you at the bridge. Stalker Complete Stalker Complete is an older mod that was like supposed to be a vanilla plus mod for new players, but nowadays most people, rightfully so, tell you to avoid it, as it actually changes several things, from gun handling to overall balance, making it not the best for a vanilla playthrough. Look, the best mod for a good vanilla playthrough now is Zone Reclamation Project, seriously, just use that and some of the optional mods that come with it and you will be fine. Zone Reclamation Project The Zone Reclamation Project is a massive bug fix mod for Shadow of Chernobyl. It pretty much fixes all of the big problems, bugs and crashes in the game. While the objective of the mod is to be as vanilla as possible, it does offer some options for small, very light mods like certain NPCs being able to repair equipment or you know, giving the player a sleeping bag and some other optional add-ons, but overall it's a very fine mod that really doesn't change that much and just kind of patches the game up. And is, in my opinion, without question, the true gentleman's way to play Shadow of Chernobyl again. The Sunrise Bandit This is a bandit stalker that can be found in the garbage on Shadow of Chernobyl. From afar, he looks like a wounded loner asking for help, but if you approach, he'll get up and attack. This is a really good, memorable moments, and it's a shame that we don't see bandits do this kind of stuff more often in the games. Like, this is the perfect example of how bandits would really operate in the zone. They wouldn't just be hostile NPCs, you know, attack on sight, but instead setting up ambushes and whatnot. I really wish they have more situations like this in Stalker 2, as it makes interacting with the bandits a lot more interesting. Blow out soon, and... Congratulations, newcomer, you have discovered your very first stalker meme. But seriously though, these are extremely old memes. They have become quite unfunny since they've been around for so long, but every now and again they can still be kind of funny. Grigorovich's Pepsi Addiction This entry is a joke concerning the CEO of GSC Game World, Sergei Grigorovich, who allegedly has a severe Pepsi addiction, to the point where he, you know, wastes all the studio's money on just buying more Pepsi. New Arsenal New Arsenal is a massive mod for Shadow of Chernobyl, with the main focus being firearms. It's very big to the point where I personally classify it as a soup light mod. It is also the best tractor simulator in the market. Seriously, there's like five quests where you do nothing but drive a fucking tractor around. It's, it's crazy. It's really good in my opinion, especially gunplay. Not so much the story. The story of New Arsenal is literally World War II time travel fan fiction. Yeah, I'm not kidding. But it is very fun though, one day I'll definitely review it. Duty Checkpoint Different Dialogue This refers to the fact that when you first reach the duty checkpoint after coming back from Agroprom, they'll ask you for help in dealing with some wild boars that are coming from the Dark Valley, and depending on how well you do, the guards will have different dialogue. Clear Sky, Every Artifact this entry refers to the fact that emissions in Clear Sky don't respawn artifacts, so in theory you could get every artifact, quote unquote. However, this would be rather difficult and you would be playing Clear Sky, so you know, if you want to challenge yourself, go for it. I'm not your dad, I'm not gonna stop you, but it seems like a 
pretty boring challenge to be honest, so I'm not sure I recommend it. Unique Groza in the beginning. This is an assault rifle that only has a 10% chance of appearing in Sidorovich's inventory and is arguably one of the best weapons in the game. This gun is the Thunder 545, a modified Groza that fires 545 instead of 9x39. The thing is, while the cartridge changes, the base damage is the same, so penetration will be worse due to the fact they're using 545, but the damage is still very high. Not only that, but it has double the durability, lasting much longer than the original Groza. There's only two examples of this weapon in the game. One of them is held by a specific duty-er in Rostock, and the second one is in Sidorovich's inventory. It has about a 10% chance of showing up. So you have to do some trickery at the beginning to get the 20,000 rubles you need to buy it. Be careful though, if you do plan on getting the weapon, you cannot talk to Wolf after rescuing Nimble, or else the weapon will disappear from Sid's inventory. In my opinion, the best way to get the money to buy it from Sid is to sneak into the checkpoint at the beginning of the game right after you spawn in. It's quite difficult, but if you give it enough tries and you abuse the quick save, quick load system, eventually you can do it. Build 1935 Build 1935 is an alpha build of Shadow of Chernobyl released by GSC due to popular demand. It's one of the most complete builds and in my opinion one of the most fascinating builds because it seems to have been made and compiled during this perfect transition moment between the original Oblivion Lost and the Shadow of Chernobyl that we know. Because you see, the plot is already quite similar to the one of Shadow of Chernobyl, it's basically the same story, but the maps are the ones from Oblivion Lost, the larger, more Crimean locations and whatnot. So it's like this weird fusion, or I guess you could call it midway point between the two. It's truly fascinating to see, a real relic of game making. I would definitely make a bigger video about builds and you know the whole progression of making Shadow Chernobyl so expect that in the future like we will go much more in depth into all the builds the differences between them and the evolution of you know what would later become Shadow of Chernobyl and to be honest out of all the builds this one just makes me sad because this is like the last build where we will ever see the original ideas and concepts. From now on, every other build is just going to be cut after cut after cut, just more content being removed. That's why I like this build so much, it's like this window into what just maybe could have been. 9x18 MP5 This is a pretty well known unique weapon in the series. The 9x18 MP5 can be found in the garbage and it's a very good early game weapon. Since it's an SMG that fires an extremely common and very cheap cartridge. It's a good weapon, but only really good as a collector's item to be honest, because if you know what you're doing, by the time you get to the garbage, you already have better weapons. So it's mostly something that will most likely be used by just new players. Fun fact, the icon it uses is the old build icon for the MP5, which is not even an MP5, it's an HK53 that uses 5.56, so a very weird icon choice. 9x19mm stash in the garbage. This is a massive ammo dump located in the garbage, giving the player a whopping 300 9x19 ammo, and it's not even hard to find, it's right in the entrance of the garbage in this tower over here. All you have to do is shoot the crates and a rain of ammo will fall to the ground. VSS in Army Warehouses In the Freedom Base at the Army Warehouses, if you go inside one of the barracks, you can locate just a random VSS just lying around in the floor. And nearby in the attic, there's two crates that in total have about 150 rounds of 9x39 ammo. It's a very random supply stash, like the thing is just sitting there on the floor. But it's a very good one if you enjoy the weapon or maybe if you just want more 9x39 ammo. So make sure you go here during your visit to the warehouses. Experienced tier. After doing a lot of work for Sidorovich, you finally decide to venture further into the zone. 
leaving the safety of the cordon behind. You have reached the garbage. It was not easy, you have fought some bandits and lowlives on the way here, and either bribed or went around the uniformed dogs on the bridge. But still, you made it. The garbage. Its mutants and bandits will test you, but with newfound confidence and a much better knowledge and understanding of the zone, you take another step forward and continue onwards. Original Zone in Crimea This is actually true. The zone was originally supposed to be in Crimea, with the center of the zone being an abandoned, unfinished nuclear reactor there. Crimea being the original location is evident even in the design and ambiance of the original Oblivion Lost maps. Especially the Corridor, with the huge ravine and other geographical formations being more in line with Crimea than Chernobyl. However, GSC CEO Sergei Grigorovich decided that the zone should be in Chernobyl instead. The developers originally did not want to make this change, so to convince them he took them on trips to the Chernobyl zone. After these trips, the development team decided to move the zone to Chernobyl, as the area really was much more iconic and memorable. Oh yeah, and also fun fact, when they were trying to enter the Chernobyl zone, they originally tried to just drive into a checkpoint and then Sergei tried to bribe the checkpoint guards with 500 Hervina to let them in. And it's just perfect. I, I love that. He just drove up to the Cordon checkpoint and was like, Hey, let me in and I'll give you 500 Hirvina. <laughs> just perfect. The group. The group is a clandestine group of scientists who worked in the zone after the first disaster. They are the ones who operated the labs in the zone and the ones who began to study and make psi fields. They are also responsible for the creation of the zone. Although they started operating during Soviet times, the collapse of the Soviet Union did very little to stop their activities. In fact, it might have made things easier for them, as the now independent Ukraine had no means of investigating the claims of these secret underground labs in the Chernobyl zone. They would then use front institutes such as Agroprom to funnel money into their operation. They also mention in some of their documents having several contacts quote unquote, that would supply them with equipment. Although most assume that they all died during the second disaster, there are some theories that they might have survived for a while longer after the zone appeared. Some of the members of the group left after the zone was created. These members would be the ones that would later create the Clear Sky Faction. Interception Interception is a mentioned only faction in the zone, so it's not sure if they're actually real or just folklore. They are mentioned in dialogue with stalkers that will relay the story of the group. They are apparently highly skilled military stalkers and spetnaz operators with bases deep in the zone, and they stay inside the zone sometimes for months. The rumors go on to suggest that they have detectors that alert them to any beast in the area, and that they even manage to tame some of the mutants. Furthermore, the stalkers mention that another stalker by the name of Pakhomich managed to catch this group on camera, meaning that there's found footage out there somewhere of interception members. The stories also say that the duty faction knows about interception, but for some reason denies their existence when asked about it. The Noosphere The Noosphere is a theorized informational field around the Earth that contains all thoughts, ideas and consciousness of every single being with cognitive abilities. This sphere also contains all human emotions as well. So if one were able to alter the Noosphere, they would be able to modify, if not outright remove, certain emotions from man. This is mostly establishing entry, it's here so that you understand the basics of what the Noosphere means. So that in later entries and tiers, if it gets brought up, you won't be confused. So please forgive the simple spark notes explanation. In later tiers, I will actually go more in depth about what the Nosphere is, its elements, and how it works in the lore. So this is just the simple setup. What's interesting is that the Nosphere is actually based on a real theory, and there will be later on in the iceberg, you know, a more serious dive. So don't worry. We will go into detail about it later. The Sea Consciousness The Sea Consciousness project was started by the group with the objective of directly interfering and altering the Noosphere. 
To achieve this goal, they used seven volunteers who had their minds interconnected, creating a super consciousness known as Seek Consciousness. With the power of these seven united minds, they will be able to alter the Nosphere and remove things such as anger, cruelty, greed, and hatred from mankind. However, things did not go as planned. Their interference with the Nosphere caused a crack in our reality, from which the Nosphere is capable of affecting the Biosphere, aka the real world. This crack in the Nosphere is the zone. Darkscape Darkscape is a cut map that was supposed to appear in Stalker Shadow of Chernobyl. It would have connected the Dark Valley with the Corridon. This is where you would go after stealing the documents from Lab X18. In Darkscape, you would basically play this giant set piece where you would be chased by the military with a hind flying by trying to kill you while you would be using the vehicles, another cut feature, to escape. The whole map is supposed to be one huge chase scene. And the whole map is built around the idea of using a vehicle because it is absolutely gigantic. Trying to walk through Darkscape is miserable because it's ginormous. <laughs> so a vehicle was absolutely necessary for this level. And you will be traversing the map while dodging military patrols and helicopter rockets while speeding towards the Corridon. The transition to this are actually still present in Shadow of Chernobyl, it's just been blocked off by debris. And you can still see it in the map too, right next to the Corridon and below the Dark Valley. One thing to note is that this level never actually received a name. Yes, you heard that right, Darkscape is most likely a placeholder name. You see, the Dark in the name refers to Dark Valley and Escape refers to Corridon, as Corridon is called Escape in the files of the game. So, the name Darkscape literally means that it is a transition, a road between Dark, as in Dark Valley, to Escape, aka Cordon. Get it? Darkscape? This placeholder naming scheme is actually used in other maps as well, such as Milrad and Radmil, which are two cut maps we will discuss later. However, if you like to, you can still consider Darkscape to be canon, as after all, you see it on the map, and the exit from the Dark Valley to the Corridon very clearly implies that the Marked One is going through Darkscape, and the fact that when you use the transition from Dark Valley to Corridon, you spawn at the tunnel that was supposed to connect to Darkscape. So, if you like to, you can just consider this area canon, and that the Marked One simply traveled through there, you know, off-screen. Who hires the Mercs? You see, this is one of the many mysteries in the franchise. The Mercs are a PMC, a private military corporation, but no one actually knows who hired them to come to the zone in the first place. What is obvious is that the Mercs' patron or sponsor must be very wealthy, as the Mercs are outfitted with high quality western equipment. Not only that, but they seem to have good intel and connections within and outside the zone. So, who's ever hiring them knows what they're doing. The theory as to his hiring them varies. Some people say that potentially could have been, you know, rival research institutes that want to be able to study artifacts but don't have permission to enter the zone, to potentially crime syndicates or corporations who want access to the artifacts and documents inside the zone for one reason or another. My favorite theory, however, is one I came up with myself. It's a little headcanon of mine, but to be honest, it makes so much sense that I generally believe it will most likely be kind of canon someday. What theory is that, you ask? Well, I'm not going to spoil the surprise now, will I? Keep watching if you want to find out, because it's lowering the iceberg. Zaton Controller The Zaton Controller is, well, a controller that can be found in a cave near the burned-out farmstead in Zaton. This controller is unique, however, in that it actually tries to communicate with you when you try to enter the cave. The controller will actually say to you, Leave here, man. Now, it's unknown if the controller is actually speaking this message to you, you know, using his mouth, or if he's like sending some kind of psychic message. But nevertheless, this is the only time a humanoid mutant speaks in the franchise clearly showing that controllers maintain a lot more of their humanity than one might expect. The creature is even behaving in a more defensive manner, wishing for you to leave its home instead of fighting you, showing some level of perhaps even morality. Overall, a very interesting, you know, interaction, so to speak. And I really hope they do more, you know, sci-fi stuff like this in Stalker 2 because it makes, you know, the mutants just 
way more interesting. Like, GSC, for the love of God, I want my speaking flashes, okay? I want the flashes cursing at me in Russian, just like the soup mods, you fox. Make it happen. Anomaly repairing. Anomaly repairing is a somewhat obscure, you know, mechanic, quote unquote, in Shadow of Chernobyl. The reason I put mechanic in quotes is because I'm not sure if this is a feature or a bug, but still, to perform this, it's actually fairly easy. You must acquire uh, certain artifacts that give you 100% protection for certain anomalies. Like, for example, having 4 to 5 batteries giving you like 100 protection from electricity. Afterwards, all you have to do is step inside the anomaly that you have protection against. And just like magic, instead of doing damage, it will heal you and your armor instead. A very useful mechanic, especially in vanilla Shadow of Chernobyl, because in that game you can't even repair your equipment, so knowing how to do this is very important if you want to keep a specific suit. The best leader of freedom. This entry is in reference to a stash that can be found in Shadow of Chernobyl, literally called Supplies of the Leader of Freedom. It's located in Pripyat and the description reads, The last thing they knew about him is that he was the sole survivor after the Scorcher. He left all the supplies in some old supermarket and moved on out. Everything went not as it was planned and that was the best Leader of Freedom in all our history. This description implies a lot of things, that first of all, a group of elite freedomers led by their ex-leader somehow found a way to bypass the brain scorcher and enter Pripyat. However, they were most likely slowly picked apart by the monolith forces inside the city, until only the leader remained. The problem is that there are multiple retellings of the story. The stash implies that the leader is the sole survivor, while dialogue with Freedom Stalkers and Pripyat imply that the whole group survived for a month and maybe even survived. All in all, it's difficult to tell what the true timeline of events is. You know, we don't know if there's only one survivor, if the leader is also dead, if they survived for a month in Pripyat and then managed to get out. It's impossible to tell, it's most likely just a truth that's been buried in folklore. Nevertheless, it's still an impressive feat for the Freedom Faction. And this ex-leader they talk about is probably the leader from Clear Sky. At least that's what I like to believe. Like, you know, I personally like to believe my headcanon about this is that after they lost the Dark Valley base and went to the army warehouses, they also tried to get to Pripyat, and the one who led the expedition is the leader from Clear Sky, and that's why Lukash in Shadow Chernobyl replaced him, because he died in Pripyat. That's just what I personally like to believe. Drivable BTR While vehicles were cut from the games, there actually is a single remaining vehicle that can be found in Shadow of Chernobyl. This vehicle is a BTR that can be encountered in the Chernobyl power plant. It's hostile to the player, but if you manage to get close to it and you just match, like you just beat the fuck out of the interact button, you can eventually get inside. Once inside, you have to put this command in the console, bind underscore KB. This will bind B to turn on engine, an unused command from when vehicles were still in the game. Afterwards, you have to press space to release the brakes, and done. You're now driving. Just be careful, it's not invincible and can be destroyed by enemies. And let me just say, I love shit like this in soccer, like I really do. Like you would think that the vehicles would be completely removed, but yet somehow, through the power of the jankiness of this engine, one manages to make it to release. Like, X-Ray Engine is an anomaly in and of itself, it really is. Like, these games, the, the way they were made is just fascinating. The Bloodsucker Shrine The Bloodsucker Shrine is a small location found in the Bloodsucker Village in army warehouses. The reason some call this a shrine and suspect that the Bloodsuckers built it is because of the highly unnatural position of the bodies present. One of the stalkers is even on top, like just stabbed in one of the tree branches, and no way that another stalker did that, because one of those branches is way up in the sky, so unless he's a victim of, you know, an explosive ragdoll and got launched up there, yeah, it wasn't a stalker that did that. 
Not only that, but it seems that some of them have been placed there instead of dying there. Like the military stalker, for example, that's just sitting on a rock. Like, it's very unlikely that they died like this. It was more likely they were placed there. With the main suspect, of course, being the bloodsuckers in the village. Personally, I really hope that it's true. Like, I really hope this is canon. And that in Stalker 2, this idea comes back. Because think about it, like, this whole idea that bloodsuckers position corpses around shrines and whatnot, sometimes hanging the victims from trees and everything, it had so much potential for horror that I really wish they explored it. Original Scorcher This is in reference to the fact that the original Brain Scorcher was in many ways wildly different from the one we got in the first game. First of all, it was slightly bigger and featured these big piles of radioactive rubble and trash just like the garbage. And the bunker that the player was supposed to access was in a completely different location, much closer to the entrance than the one that's in the final game, which is right under the antennas. Overall, this version feels darker, more oppressive, like it has this kind of air, instead of being like this forest with the antennas, it's instead just giant trash piles with these bunkers they're like in the mountain and then there's this giant antennas in the background i certainly like the uh, atmosphere let's call it that and man like the more things i see they got cut from stalker that were in oblivion lost like dude it just makes me sad like this game could have been even greater than the one we already got the balaclava soldier the balaclava soldier is a almost unused character model for the soldiers of the security service of Ukraine. It only has a small chance of spawning during the military raid on the bandit base after you leave Lab X-18, but you can actually see him in one of the images on one of the PDA entries. So if you can't see him in motion and he just doesn't spawn in, you can see him right there instead. Build Zombies Build Zombies is the name for the original zombies from Oblivion Lost. These guys were more akin to the stereotypical image of a zombie. Slow, shambling humans with a hunger for flesh. They were cut and instead replaced with the hip-firing maniacs zombies that we now know and love. However, they can be very easily restored with mods as they are actually fully functioning. You can also still see them in the final game, as their models are heavily reused as bodies throughout the zone, most famous of which being the hanged zombie in the entrance to the bar. General Tachenko General Tachenko is one of the founding fathers of the Duty faction. He was the leader before Krylov and Voronin, but one day during a average, you know, artifact hunting session, he's just suddenly disappeared, vanishing from the face of the earth. Eventually, in Call of Pripyat, the player discovers the fate of Tachenko. He died from starvation while stuck inside a spatial anomaly, and after retrieving his PDA, it's discovered that he actually caused the communications breakdown that caused the military operation to go haywire and duty to be formed. He did this because he was tired of his military life and wanted to remain in the zone, forming the duty faction in the process. Wolf's brother Wolf actually has a brother by the name of Hound. You can find him in Clear Sky being held hostage by bandits. Saving him is an optional quest that is given by Wolf, and he's really not important outside of this quest, he's a, quite a minor character. Still. I personally like to believe that the reason he does not show up in Shadow of Chernobyl is that because of his experience as being a captive of the bandits, he just decided to, you know, leave the zone for good, explaining why he's absent in the next game. Doing the car park alone. See, this is actually a quite well known fact. See, when you're doing the first mission of Shadow of Chernobyl where I have to save Nimble, you can decide to go in alone without help from the other stalkers in attacking the car park. If you do this, you actually receive a better reward. But of course, the obvious side effect is that the mission is harder since you don't get any support. But to be honest, I highly recommend you do this as the reward is worth it, you know, for the beginning of the game. 
just make sure to talk to Wolf after saving Nimble to actually get the reward. Build 1865 Build 1865 is an internal development build for Oblivion Lost that was made to test the AI system. The main difference between this one and the other builds is the presence of previously unseen game locations. It also seems to have some weird, you know, lighting and weather systems. Not only that, but of course, the uh, AI life system of this build that controls NPC and monster behavior was very advanced for its time. Minigun The minigun is a cut weapon that originally appeared in Oblivion Lost. However, for some reason, the minigun stayed in the files of the games and was even usable in some later builds that were already set in the zone. This has led to some to speculate that maybe they might have planned to include it in the mainline series. However, I find that very unlikely as the huge minigun feels a little too much for a single stalker to hoof around. So maybe it only stayed for testing purposes, who knows. Veteran Tier You survive the garbage, explore the area around the military base in Agropron, and even enter the bandit's home turf in a dark valley. Now working for barkeep and duty, you have completed many contracts, and thus you grow more and more experience each day. However, you're still not experienced, well equipped or confident enough to enter the labs. But hey, you have still come a long way. And because of your extended time at the bar, you have heard many of the zone's legends, rumors, stories, and heroes. So your knowledge of this anomalous area is growing every day. Living copies slash counterparts. Living copies or counterparts are a sadly scrapped idea from Clear Sky, back when it was originally called Anarchy Cell, which let me just say is such a cool fucking title, seriously, it is so much better than the one we got, like why did you change it GSC, Anarchy Cell was perfect. But anyways, the counterparts were supposed to be copies or clones of stalkers created by the zone for some unknown reason. You see, the original idea for Clear Sky was that the zone was beginning to become almost alive, being described as being stuck in kind of an infant-like state in the design documents. And so these counterparts were created by her, again, for some reason that we never got to find out, unfortunately. I really, really want these guys to come back. Jesse, if you're listening, please put these guys in Stalker 2. They're one of the best ideas i ever seen for Stalker. They are so good, they deserve to be canon. Agents Agents are a certain type of stalker that has been brainwashed by the sea consciousness. They are different from the monolith fighters in that they are completely conscious and aware of their actions. However, they have been programmed as sleeper agents, meaning that even without realizing they are obeying the orders of the sea consciousness helping them eliminate any stalker that presents a threat to the sea consciousness, such as, for example, any stalker that attempts to break through to the center of the zone. Marked one, the protagonist of Shadow Chernobyl is one of these agents, sent to hunt down and kill Strelok for attempting to reach the center. Sadly, the only example of these agents in the series is Marked one. We never see any others, which is just so unfortunate. Like the idea that a normal stalker could just snap the second they see you as their you know, sleeper cell orders activate and they start shooting. Like that's a perfect idea and I really hope they explore some of this in the sequel. Oblivion Lost Oblivion Lost is the original project GSC was working on. It was supposed to be kind of this futuristic shooter in the vein of games like Quake 2 for example. However, after the weak sales of another GSC game called Codename Outbreak, which was kind of similar to Oblivion Lost in many ways, the team decided to do something different in their next game. They instead decided to make a game inspired by the novel Roadside Picnic. From now on, the name changed from Oblivion Lost to Stalker Oblivion Lost. Stalker Oblivion Lost Stalker Oblivion Lost was the original name for what would eventually become Stalker Shadow of Chernobyl. 
The reason that they tried to keep the title of Oblivion Lost is because GSC had already used a lot of money to market it, so they did not want it to go to waste. Instead of just describing to you, you know, what the differences are, I think I'm just gonna show you. Like, if we launch one of these early builds, in fact I actually have one of the earliest builds of Oblivion Lost right here, and as you can see the differences are immediate, like the moment you launch, the atmosphere is completely different from the original idea of a Quake style shooter. And you can actually see that the first ideas for levels are already being made. In this build we can explore two of them, a very early Agropon and Corridon. What's interesting is that Agropon really did not change that much over the years, like you can tell that this first map here is supposed to be the first complex, you know what I mean? So the ideas of Agropon were kind of already being finalized. While on the other hand, the Corridon changed wildly. It was originally much bigger with a completely different look and feel. This version is also um, very raw. Like, trust me, trying to get footage of this build for this video was a nightmare. Like, for some reason, Xbox DVR just did not accept this game. Like, it just was completely incompatible. Like, I, ch I had to do... Like, it was a nightmare getting this fucking footage, but eventually I got it. And overall, it's a really early test build of what would later become Shadow of Chernobyl. Now, this is not the only build of a Stalker Oblivion Lost that we have. So later on in the iceberg, we will also see some, you know, other builds that were later on in the development process. So don't worry, we will go more in depth, you know, about the development cycle of Oblivion Lost and how everything went down. It's just not right now, it's deeper on the iceberg. Like later on, we'll talk about, you know, specific concepts and specific builds and everything. So this is mostly just kind of a setup entry, you know, so you can understand what we're talking about. But later on, we will go into more detail about all the different builds and whatnot. The zone is not growing. This is a theory in response to the widespread belief among certain citizens of the zone that the zone is slowly growing. The zone did grow when it first appeared, as the original zone of exclusion was 30 kilometers, but when the zone appeared, it was expanded to 60. And when the first Great Emission happened in June 10th, 2006, the zone grew by 5 kilometers, meaning that the actual size of the zone is 65 kilometers. So, there does seem to be a pattern of growth here. However, some stalkers object to this notion, such as Duty and Freedom members, and the ecologists nor Clear Sky ever speak of such a thing happening, so it may have been a one-time thing, and perhaps now the zone has stabilized. Everlasting Fires If you have played Stalker throughout your journey, you might have noticed that some of the campfires never actually go out, even if left alone for days. This has led some to theorize that the campfire might be getting affected by the zone, acting more like a small burner anomaly, and thus would never go out. This is actually more likely than you think, as anomalies do seem to be attracted to certain objects, like for example electro anomalies, being many times near or at electrical equipment, burner anomalies being formed inside old incinerators in the labs, and fruit punch anomalies forming in areas with old chemical compounds. So this theory of the campfires being somewhat anomalous themselves might be more likely than you think. Artificial slash lab made anomalies and artifacts. This entry comes from the fact that some artifact descriptions mention that the scientists are trying to or either can't make a certain artifact on laboratory conditions, such as, for example, the Mama Beads artifact, which reads An extremely rare artifact, keep it safe because it has no negative qualities, scientists cannot figure out how to create such an object in laboratories. This description implies in some way that they might have figured out some way to create anomalies willingly. This is supported by some equipment that can be found in Lab X18 that seems to be some sort of chemical mixer that, coincidentally enough, has been transformed into a fruit punch anomaly. I mean. We already know that the ecologists use artifacts in creating their suits, 
as if you don't know, the reason the ecologist suits have such powerful radiation protection is actually because they are saturated with a lotion created using the urchin artifact. Even further evidence for this theory is found in the description of the urchin artifact, in which it claims that Sakharov wrote a piece of work titled Ionization and Polarization of the Components of Rare Artifacts, in which he theorizes that it's not realistic to create such artifacts in lab conditions for at least a decade. So there's definitely attempts made by people like the ecologists to create lab-made artifacts, which already implies the creation of lab-made anomalies. This is definitely only background lore at this point, but hopefully we'll get more, you know, info on this in Stalker 2. Operation Monolith Operation Monolith is the massive military operation that happens near the end of Shadow of Chernobyl when you first reach the power plant. The plans and map used by the military to organize this operation can be found in the dead body of a military stalker when you first enter the area. The main objective of this operation was to finally secure the power plant from the monolith, and although at first the operation was going relatively well, a blowout most likely released by the sea consciousness destroyed most if not all of the military personnel in the area and thus the operation ended in failure. However, the data collected from it would be later used to plan out a second operation that, although sadly also failed, was a lot more successful than this one. Quartet Quartet is the commanding officer of Operation Monolith. He was the commander of all forces in the CNPP area, and you can actually find him in there. He looks just like any other officer, but if you kill him, you can hear in the radio the military asking him to respond, to which there is obviously no reply. This actually stops any further military radio communications from happening, as you have literally killed the commanding officer, so the chain of command has become completely unstable. Operation Fairway Operation Fairway is the military operation that happened after the failure of Operation Monolith. Using the intel acquired most likely by the few survivors of that operation, the military constructed special helicopters named Stingrays, which were built to last under zone conditions and even be emission proof. With these upgrades and using the airborne maps collected during the Operation Monolith, they believed that not a single chopper would be lost. However, all of them disappeared. This is the event that starts Call of Pripyat, as Alexander Diktaev enters the zone as a loner to investigate the reason for the crash. Artifact Activation Artifact Activation is a semi-cut feature that was supposed to appear in Shadow of Chernobyl and Clear Sky. It was the ability to use artifacts to spawn the anomaly that generated them. So, for example, you could use a gravitational artifact to spawn a vortex, for example. It was a pretty cool mechanic, and it actually is still present in Clear Sky, but only in the Artifact Hunt game mode in multiplayer, weirdly enough. It even has fully completed animations and everything. So it's a mystery to me why it was cut. It's also definitely canon, by the way, as the artifact activation is mentioned by Yar when spoken to in Clear Sky. So it's definitely something that happens in the universe of Stalker. So again, it puzzles me why it was cut. Hey, now that I think about it, maybe artifact activation is how the ecologists manage to create lab-made anomalies and artifacts. Yeah, just notice that. Yantar Secret Teleporters slash Secret Teleporters This one is actually true, there are secret teleporters not just in Antar but in many areas throughout the zone that send you to different levels. This is mostly a developer tool, you see it's used to send NPCs to certain areas at certain times. The most famous one of these teleporters is the one in Clear Sky that allows you to go from the swamps straight to Lamansk. This is actually the teleporter that the mercs use to show up on the hill on the other side of the bridge. These secret teleporters are frequently used by speedrunners, as one might expect. Sharon is Scar 
This is a very popular fan theory that the protagonist of Clear Sky, Mercenary Scar, became Sharon in Shadow of Chernobyl. And to be honest, although it's definitely not confirmed in any of the games, it's pretty likely. We know Scar was most likely captured and brainwashed by the monolith after Clear Sky. We also know that Scar is a highly skilled combatant, so his position as commander of the monolith forces in Pripyat would make sense. There's also the most damning piece of evidence in my opinion. Both Scar and Sharon use the exact same weapon, the Vintar BC. Which, yeah, I guess you could say that's circumstantial at best, but think about it. The weapon Scar is known for is the Vintar BC. And after he's captured by the monolith, this Sharon guy comes out of nowhere in Shadow of Chernobyl, is more skilled than your average monolith fighter, and is the closest the faction has to a normal on-the-ground commander and leader, something that we know Scar will be good at because of his experience in the faction wars. And yeah, it might be bullshit, but I believe it. Build 1114 Build 1114 is an extremely important build because this right here is the beginning of Stalker as we know it. Build 114 is the moment GSC shifted from the Quake style shooter they were making to the more sci-fi roadside picnic inspired game they wanted to make. This is also the first appearance of Agroprom which might make Agroprom the very first map in Stalker history. Of course this build is incredibly basic, it only features one area, couple of guns, including the cut high power and minigun, and some soldiers, zombies, some rats for you to shoot, and it's also incredibly buggy, this thing loves to crash. But it's still incredibly cool to see something like this, the first step in a huge journey that although in my opinion, you know, ended kinda tragically, it still brought a shadow of Chernobyl in the entire series we know and love, so... I mean, this is where it started, and it's a phenomenal thing that we can even take a look at it in the first place. Morlocks Morlocks were a cut mutant that was supposed to appear in Clear Sky in the also cut area of Pripyat Underground. They are described as these vile, degenerate creatures that live in the tunnels beneath Pripyat. They are also very similar to the super mutants of the Fallout franchise. And their name actually comes from a novel named The Time Machine by H.G. Wells. As in the novel, a race of subterranean cannibals serve as the main antagonists. So it's clear that they, alongside the super mutants from the Fallout franchise, were the inspiration for the Morlock. And although the idea of these insane workers trapped beneath Pripyat after the zone appeared is very cool, the design of the Morlocks is, in my opinion, a little too out there for Stalker. If they were redesigned, however, I could see them being a cool addition to the series, in my opinion. If anything, I really just hope that GSC, you know, at least brings back the Pripyat Underground, as the idea of these huge tunnels beneath Pripyat is very cool. So I really hope they come back in Stalker 2. Universal Soldier. So. I, uh, I must apologize, like I'm sorry, but I could not find much on this one. When I searched this up and I tried to find more information about, you know, Stalker Universal Soldier, the only thing that I found was a trailer for an either yet unreleased or unfinished mod on YouTube called Universal Soldier. It was supposed to be released in 2018, but has sadly never come out. Like, this is the most that I could find on it. If, if there is more to this, then I am simply unaware, so please tell me in the comments. Lost Alpha Lost Alpha is a standalone mod created by Desowave. It was supposed to be THE mod to bring back the original Stalker and its ideas. And while it does make a very valiant effort and seems to be a pretty, you know, good mod, Halfway through the mod, the team decided to, you know, instead of recreating what the design document said, they would instead just make up their own plot, resulting in a clusterfuck of a game with ridiculous things like the Illuminati being an important faction behind the zone, and many other, um, you know, humorous ideas. Overall, a really big disappointment, although I hear that the director's cut version of the mod fixes some of this, you know, stupidity, so who knows, I might try it someday. I have also heard, but please, 
please take this with a huge grain of salt because I have no idea if this is true. I have no sources to back this up, okay? The source is that I made it the fuck up. But I was on a thread once on 4chan and there was this guy claiming that the development team of Lost Alpha were in contact with GSC and to help them make the mod, GSC gave them like an SDK for Stalker that was super good and you know made the process of making the mod a lot easier. But for some reason, after they were finished with the mod, they never shared the SDK with the community, which is something that most likely has held back Stalker modding for like years just because of this. Again, I have no source for this. It's literally just the words of a schizophrenic on the internet. But, you know, I just want to put this out there. If any of you have, you know, a way to prove or disprove this, please, you know, leave a comment, send me an email, something, because I really want to know if this is true or not. Bread. Bread, quote unquote, is an unusual item that can be found in Stalker Shadow of Chernobyl inside Borov's office in the Bandit base. It is unusable and shares the same image as the normal bread item. There is no use for it anywhere and it seemingly exists for no reason. This has led to it becoming a quite popular meme in the community as the quotations around bread seems to imply that it's not bread but something else leading to it appearing in a lot of memes. However, this is actually not the only item in the game to have this behavior. There is one other item that has the exact same naming convention and is also unusable. Hand underscore radio. The hand underscore radio is another unusable item that can again be found in the Dark Valley. But instead of it being inside of Boros' office, it's in the bucket of this structure right here. And I actually highly recommend that you visit this area as it contains a very rare Mama Beads artifact. Because of this, most people have most likely picked up this item without even noticing it. But I know what you're asking yourself right now. I know what you're thinking. What is the purpose of these items? Why do they even exist in the first place? Well, I'm not sure why either, but I found a theory online that these items exist to be used by NPCs in their animations. So for example, when you see an NPC eating bread around a campfire or a stalker talking in the radio, they are using these items. And the quotes around them are apparently to signify it in the engine that they're supposed to be used for animations or something like that. Again, don't quote me on this because I have no proof for it except for some schizos word online, so take it with a grain of salt. Guitar Yet another unusable item. However, this one seems to be more complete than the others. First, it does not have those weird quotes around it, and it actually possesses an actual inventory image, but no description. What's also interesting is that this item actually shows up in every single game. However, it's only possible to obtain the guitar without glitches in Shadow of Chernobyl. In the other games, you have to hope that an NPC's inventory glitches out and apparently reverts to like a beta inventory, which inside of it will be the guitar, allowing you to buy it for 30 rubles. Overall, a very rare but sadly useless item. Campfire Stories when stalkers sit around the campfire, they might start swapping stories with each other, which range from comical to short horror stories. Sadly, all this awesome world building is untranslated, so unless you know Ukrainian or Russian, you won't understand any of it, which sucks. I really wish that GSE had translated this dialogue, as some of these stories are pretty cool. If you want to see them for yourself, just search them up on YouTube, it's pretty easy to find. It's still kind of sad that most will probably never understand any of this. Like, they will play through every single game and everything will just fly right over their heads. Zombified Tourists Zombified Tourists is in reference to the event that sparked the zone being closed off to the entire world. You see, in 2001, a bus full of foreign tourists disappeared into the zone. 
Years later, stalkers reported seeing zombies that spoke mumbled English, making it obvious what the fate of the tourists were, being zombified most likely by one of the many psi fields throughout the zone. After this event, the Ukrainian government closed off the zone from entry, enforcing this order with deadly force if necessary. Sleeping in Ashes V1 Sleeping in Ashes V1 is a track composed by Moose, the main guy responsible for the Stalker soundtrack. This song only appears in the Shadow of Chernobyl promotional soundtrack, and it's pretty good. One thing I'd like to point out is that I personally believe this song is an early version of the main menu theme for Shadow of Chernobyl, due to some big similarities between the two. Lurk 1.1 with Working Artifacts Lurk is an overhaul mod for Shadow of Chernobyl that for some weird unknown reason removed artifacts, which is just puzzling to me as to why they will remove such a core feature of the series. But regardless, this entry refers to the possibility that someone may have a modified copy of Lurk that re-enables the artifacts. However, that's unlikely, and if you actually try to search for this, you'll probably just end up giving your PC a bad case of viruses and shitcoin miners, because you know, you clicked some random link on VK or whatever, so I don't recommend it. Save Game Corruption This is sadly something that just happens sometimes. The X-Ray Engine is a weird, janky, spaghetti cold beast, so problems like this are bound to happen at some point. Although, depending on how you look at it, this might be more uh, intentional than you think. More about that in the last tier. Stalker Mobile is canon. Yes, Stalker has a mobile game. I know, at first I did not believe it either, but yes, there is one, and it's fucking scuffed. It's available for any phone that supports Java 2 applications, and it's very, very basic. There's no storyline, and you just go around, shoot enemies, collect artifacts, sell them at the trader, so on forever. It's probably good for some small entertainment in the metro or something, but it's nothing special. This theory, however, states that it's canon to the mainline games. And while some of you might scoff at this instantly, think about it. It could be canon, because you see, what do the other stalkers in the zone, you know, the ones that aren't the protagonists with huge goals to accomplish, do? You know, just your average loner. What do you think they do? They shoot enemies, they get artifacts, they sell at the trader over and over again. In Stalker Mobile, you're just playing as the average stalker in the zone, living their relatively simple lives and following a simple goal, get money. So if you see it like that, it could be canon. The zone is growing. This entry is a counter argument to the previous the zone is not growing theory. You see, the idea that the zone is growing is actually championed by the Sikh consciousness itself, as they try to use this to convince Shrelok to join them, promising to stop the zone's growth. And the Sikh consciousness is literally plugged into the no sphere, so one might think that their opinion should be extremely valuable in this matter and that they're probably correct. However, consider the following, Strelok is basically about to kill them, and that just might be some lie they're saying to convince Strelok to join them instead. Personally, I think that even if the zone is growing, the Sikh consciousness does not actually want to fix the problem at all. These guys see themselves as basically messiahs here to remove all wrong emotions and thoughts from humanity, so I highly doubt that they would actually seal the crack in the nosphere and abandon their megalomaniacal plans. So personally, I don't fully trust what they say. However, many stalkers do report that more and more powerful mutants keep appearing in the edges of the zone, and with the fact that the emissions have become a lot more frequent, there might still be a chance that the zone is slowly growing like some kind of giant tumor. Something I would also like to mention is that in the trailer for Stalker 2, the professor we hear in the radio mentions that the zone has been stable for 10 years. Some of you might think that this completely disproves the theory, but if you know how storytelling works, it's very very likely that this is just a setup for something to come in and destroy that stability. So, who knows, we might see the zone grow or become more violent in the sequel at least. Expert Tier 
Under orders from Barman, you raided the lab beneath the Dark Valley in search of documents. Barely making out alive, you face some of the toughest mutants the zone has to offer. You are tired and hungry. The horrors of the lab have scarred you for life. You almost start to question if staying in the zone is a good idea, but deep inside you, a new drive, a new instinct takes over. The documents you have retrieved have given you a small glimpse into the true nature of the zone. And now the zone and its secrets are calling out to you. This siren's call beckons you to further your investigation, to explore more and more, and to go deeper and deeper still into the zone. As you learn of the existence of yet another lab in Yantar, you set out towards the wild territory. Prepared and determined, your search for the truth has finally begun. I don't trust you. This is a line spoken by Gary if you decide to stay in the zone after you finish Call of Pripyat. He will say it when you approach the laundromat. Some might interpret this as a stalker shunning the major since they now know that he's a spy basically. However, this is sadly just a bug. He was actually supposed to say a completely different line, so interesting. But no, it's just another anomaly in the engine, I guess. Lebedev joined the Sea Consciousness. This is a fan theory that states that the CS leader Lebedev, after getting hit by the emission at the Underclear Sky, joined the Sea Consciousness. This does make sense, as Lebedev was one of the members of the group, and I find it unlikely that the Sikh Consciousness would just turn a guy like that into another monolithian soldier. Obviously, he's a very intelligent scientist, and we do know that the bodies connected to the Sikh Consciousness can eventually die, so maybe they replaced one of the dead members with the now brainwashed Lebedev. Now, the only real evidence for this comes from the fact that the Seacon representative we meet at the end of Shadow of Chernobyl has a voice that's very similar to Lebedev's. So this is quite obviously just a headcanon, but personally, I like to believe it's true. It makes for a much more interesting ending to Lebedev's story, and it's something that GSC could use in future titles as a plot point. Like the entire idea of the old Clear Sky Leader now being part of the Sea Consciousness and whatnot is very interesting and it could make for some very good storytelling, so I kinda hope they make it canon. Not only that, but it will be a much cooler ending for Lebedev instead of just dying to the emission or becoming a monolith soldier. It would just be way better of an ending for him. Monolith controls the world. This is a theory to try and explain you know, how the monolith forces are able to get supplied in the first place and who might be supplying them. You see, the monolith, as we all know, are the fanatical defenders of the zone, shooting anyone on sight. However, they must obviously have some kind of contact with the outside world, as that's the only way they could acquire their weapons, ammunition and suits. This theory states that the Sea Consciousness is sending agents to the outside world with the objective of making connections and establishing supply routes for the monolith faction. This theory goes a step further and says that these agents might have infiltrated powerful governmental institutions such as the military for example, and that the monolith and by extension the Sea Consciousness might have a lot more control outside the zone than we might think. This is even supported by in-game evidence. If I'm not mistaken, in Clear Sky, so correct me if I'm wrong on this, some stalkers will sometimes tell you this story about some group of stalkers that managed to break into a monolith warehouse. And they say how the warehouse is completely packed with supplies, with calibers for every weapon, suits all over the place, like they literally have everything they could ever want. Obviously, the monolith is being supplied, you know, by some outside force outside the zone. So in my opinion, it's pretty obvious that this is something the agents do. Like, it just makes sense. The Sea Consciousness brainwashes a bunch of people, sends them to the outside world, and then they start making connections, friends, and all that. And eventually, they can start bringing back things for the monolith. Like, that just makes too much sense. So I personally really believe this theory. Sakharov is zombified. 
This theory is due to the fact that Sakharov, the ecologist professor in Yantar, is notorious for sending out stalkers and some of his own research personnel to do tasks for him that are like ridiculously dangerous. And for some reason he doesn't seem to understand the true dangers of the zone. Now the game tries to chalk this up to him just being you know, this ignorant guy that's locked up inside of a bunker so he doesn't fully understand how dangerous the zone is. But this theory states that no, the reason he is like this is because he has or is suffering from residual psi damage from the emitter in Yantar, which is damaging his cognitive abilities and making it so he does not fully comprehend the danger he's putting people in. And the thing is that this might actually be true. You see, the psi emitters in the zone mostly affect a certain concentrated area. But just like any other form of energy or radiation, just being near the affected area might already cause some small side effects. And Sakharov is right next to the Yantar factory all day. So it would be stupid to think that it has no effect on him whatsoever. So yeah, this theory might have some validity to it and Sakharov might be suffering some minor damage to his brain that's making him act like this. Lamansk Time Machine This is an easter egg located in Lamansk, in the basement of one of the houses. In there you can find this time machine, which is a reference to an old Soviet miniseries called Guest from the Future. Metro 2033 Stole Assets It is a well-known fact that 4A Games, the makers of the Metro series, were ex-GSC employees, who used to work in the Stalker franchise. When they left the company, they started to work in the Metro franchise, and while making some of the early builds of Metro 2023, they actually used multiple assets from Stalker in them, such as sounds and textures, something else I heard but have no confirmation of, so please take this with a grain of salt, is that the model for the Lurker was originally for Stalker and had been created for a new mutant, but after the now members of 4A Games left GSC, they took some of these assets, including the model of what would later become the Lurker. Original Swamps The original swamps, or also known as the Dead Swamps in some mods, are, well, the original version of the Great Swamps that were supposed to appear in Clear Sky. It's very different from the release version, having a huge main road and a ruined bridge cutting the map in half. This area also had many military stalkers, and this would be the place where the Doctor lived. An interesting feature of this map is the reflections in the water. You see, they're not actual reflections. There is an exact copy of the map turned upside down that's used to create the illusion of a reflection. Dead City Dead City is a cut area that suffered various changes during development. Originally, in Oblivion Lost, it was supposed to be the base of freedom. However, after Sin was removed, and Oblivion Lost became Shadow of Chernobyl, Freedom was sent to the warehouses, and that city would become the base of the Mercs. In the original Shadow of Chernobyl storyline, you were supposed to be captured by the Mercs and imprisoned there alongside Dark. You would later escape after the military launched a raid in the area that would allow you to escape. The area, however, was cut, as the developers felt it addition was a little useless, as the player would only visit the area once and never come back. Although, to be honest, I wish they kept it, as the scene of trying to flee and retrieve your stuff while a massive merc and military fight happens would have been a pretty memorable moment. Original Oblivion Lost the original Oblivion Lost, as was mentioned before, was a sci-fi, you know, Quake 2 style shooter set in the far future. And very little is known about the plot of Oblivion Lost. The only thing we really know is that you would play as some sort of scientist or exploration team, visiting multiple planets and utilizing some pretty anachronistic equipment, as you have advanced robots helping you, but at the same time there's single rotor helicopters which are all Heinz and you're using older weapons like a Grozer, for example. Overall, we just don't really know what the story of Oblivion Lost was or how far they really got into it before they decided to switch to Stalker Oblivion Lost. Lift Anomaly 
The lift anomaly is a cut anomaly that was supposed to weaken the pull of gravity, allowing the player and objects within it to float. It is also the anomaly that is responsible for forming the Pelico artifact. It is actually only semi-cut, as you can allegedly find one of these anomalies in the Pripyat Stadium, although I was unable to find it myself. This is the cut anomaly that I hope the most comes back, as the idea of all these various objects being stuck in mid-air, as the pull of gravity has been weakened and allowing the player to potentially make these huge leaps using the weak gravity is something that can both create unique, interesting sights in the zone and potentially create some really cool gameplay possibilities. Zombified Freedomer To the east of the Freedom Base in the swamps, you can locate a shack. Inside the shack is a semi-zombified Freedomer who, as Max explains, saw something in the Bloodsucker village that made him lose his mind. He has now barricaded himself in the shack, shooting all who come near. Creature in the Fog Also known as the Mist Creature, this creature was supposed to be the one responsible for the Saiya missions in the Yantar area. It is, in essence, an early version of the Miracle Machine, and it does appear in some builds. However, it is obviously in a very unfinished state. Rusty Hair Anomaly Another cut anomaly, this one is quite similar to the Burned Fuzz Anomaly, but instead of being more of a plant-based anomaly, this one would instead form in metal surfaces, and touching any part of the rusty hair would cause the part exposed to it to immediately blacken and rot. There is still a leftover model of this anomaly left in the game files, and this is the anomaly that was supposed to spawn the sea urchin, thorn, and crystal artifacts. Pripyat had fully explorable interiors. This is true. Originally, every single apartment building in Pripyat was supposed to be fully modeled and explorable, every floor and room. Needless to say, this was very ahead of its time, especially for a game that started development in 2002. However, making such a map run on PCs back then was, well, a challenge, so they had to scale it back for the final game. Oblivion Lost Remake 2.5 Oblivion Lost Remake is a standalone mod created with the objective of completely restoring the old Stalker, the original Stalker Oblivion Lost that never was. This mod is uh, something else in my opinion. It's truly special, like it's literally cobbled together old build spaghetti code. The team is trying to like bring back old design document ideas and etc. And it's such a massive undertaking that it's generally impressive it even exists. I adore this mod. It is very easily up there as one of the best mods ever made in my opinion. Like these guys are doing straight up fucking video game necromancy, reviving old leaked build content and making it work. And I'm gonna be honest here, I'm gonna get a little, you know, personal opinion, but it makes me so sad that such, you know, truly soulful, meaningful, 10 out of 10 content like this gets overshadowed by some normie, Redditor, Tarkov shit like Anomaly. Like, that makes me so sad. This mod is the one that deserves all the attention. It's better made, better written, and more atmospheric than any other mod I have played. Like, you could take every single one of these Schmilsin Altist mods that are covered in so many reshade effects and HDR dynamic lighting that it looks like the most soulless, unreal engine project looking shit. You could put them all together and they will not come even close to touching the atmosphere of Oblivion Lost Remake. Like, it is out of this league. It's untouchable. And you, yes, you, you should be playing it now. Mercury Ball Mercury Ball is a cut artifact that only appears in older builds. It is a large fluorescent ball overgrown with moss, and it actually appears as a mission item in build 1844. What's weird is 
there is no real explanation as to why it was cut. It was pretty much finalized. It even has a world model, an inventory model, like it has everything. For some reason they finished this artifact and then just decided to not do anything with it. However, it does show up in a lot of mods, so it's not completely unused. It has been revived in fan projects, so there's that at least. The 4A engine is a modified X-ray engine. This is a rumor that the 4A engine used in the Metro games is either a modified X-ray engine or that it uses some code from the X-ray engine. This rumor mostly comes down to the fact that the developers of the Metro series 4A games used to be GSC employees who left after Shadow of Chernobyl. And we already know that they did use some assets from Stalker while making Metro, as we can see in build 375 of Metro, that is very clearly filled with assets from Stalker. So I mean, who's to say that they also didn't take a few lines of code here and there, or maybe an assembly of X-ray engine and whatnot. Of course, there is zero confirmation of this, so you have to take it with a huge pinch of salt, but I mean, hey. You never know. Shooting down helicopters. Yes, it is possible to shoot down helicopters in Vanilla Stalker. It's just somewhat hard to do and most of the time choppers will run away if they take too much damage. But you can do it and there is plenty of videos online showing it, it's actually not that hard. Final Day. Final Day is a cut faction that was supposed to appear in Shadow of Chernobyl. They were quite similar to Clear Sky, being stalkers that studied the zone and that believed that Doomsday was in the horizon, while also trying to create psychotropic weaponry. Not much more is known about them. However, unlike other cut factions, this one is actually still canon, as you will see in the next entry. Final Day was destroyed by Ghost. During dialogue with the barman, if you ask about Ghost, he will state the following. He's one of Strelok's men. They say he can sneak in anywhere without being noticed. I heard that he took out the leader of some crazy group. What was the name? Ah, Final Day. That's the one. They were pretty wild, those boys. As the barman states, Ghost is the one responsible for the death of the faction following the assassination of their leader. It is never stated why Ghost decided to kill the leader of the faction, or what the faction's objective was, outside of the barman's remark that they were quote unquote pretty wild. This is the only moment the faction is mentioned and no more detail was given. But if you do consider the next entry to be true, then it might make sense why Ghost decided to assassinate their leader. Final Day Killed Fang Final Day Killed Fang is a theory that the Final Day faction are the true culprits behind the assassination of Fang, and that is why the faction was destroyed by Ghost as a revenge for his death. This might not make a lot of sense now, because to be honest, to actually understand this entry, you need a little bit of additional context. As this theory hinges on the idea that Final Day is the successor faction to Clear Sky, and that's something that will only come up later on in the iceberg, but don't worry, this will make a lot more sense later. International Scientific Group the International Scientific Group is a cut faction that was supposed to appear in the original intro of Clear Sky. They were a UN-funded science group that tried to reach and study the generators. In the old interactive intro of Clear Sky, Scar would be leading a squad of ISG troopers before a blowout occurred, and then he would be rescued by Clear Sky. The faction never appear again. Although they are mentioned in folklore, and by Hog in Clear Sky, so they might still be semi-canon. Multiple Brain Scorchers This entry is based on the dialogue spoken by the Seacon representative, who says that the Sea Consciousness have placed multiple side fields, one of which the player knows as Brain Scorcher. 
This implies the existence of multiple brain scorcher like facilities in more unseen areas of the zone. Like, the Seacon representative is very specific with his words. He literally says multiple psi fields, one of them you know as the brain scorcher. So he's very clearly implying that there's more of these facilities out there. My personal theory is that these other brain scorchers are around the nuclear power plant, basically forming this giant security grid around it. The reason I believe this is because it answers one of the questions that I had when I started playing Stalker. Like, why are we trying to reach the power plant through the Ukrainian side? You know, wouldn't it be easier to go from the Belarusian side and then go south to the Chernobyl power plant? But of course, I think that the C consciousness accounted for this, so they created way more of these antennas and place them all around the Chernobyl power plant so that you know if you tried to get smart and go from the Belarusian side down to the power plant you would still get fucked anyway that's how I think it went down like these multiple brain scorchers he mentions I think it's some kind of security grid around the power plant and the brain scorcher in the game is basically just one of the nodes in this giant grid so that means that there are way more psi fields in the zone than we saw in the games and thus way more laboratories that we have never visited. Master Tier Yantar Factory was a challenge, but by now your skills have developed considerably. The visage of the miracle machine gave you a new perspective in just how far the group went and you wonder what their true capabilities are. Your desire to explore and understand the zone is growing ever more. You know what must be done next. The road north beckons you, but the brain scorcher, its eternal, silent watchman, blocks your path. You must either circumvent this obstacle or destroy it. You make one last trip to the bar to gear up, and now you stand before the barrier. The red forest just up ahead, you prepare yourself mentally for the road ahead. Every journey begins with a single step. This is step one. Tourist Delight's Contents Tourist Delight is one of the many food items that we can find in the Stalker games. The problem is, is that it's never said what's actually inside the Tourist Delight. The description only tells us that it was found in the military warehouses and it was used by the Ukrainian military. That's it, there's no more information. They don't tell us what's inside of it, they don't tell us what it's made of, is it meat, is it that? There's a lot of theories on people online discussing what a tourist delight is supposed to be. And I was very puzzled by this, so I decided to do some research. And I think I actually found what tourist delight is based on. Tourist Delight is just an Ukrainian MRE. You see, the Ukrainian military uses these cans to store things like meat for the troops, which means that Tourist Delight in the games is most likely some form of, you know, Toshanka or canned meat. If you want to see a real-life Tourist Delight in action, I will leave in this video's description a link to another video where a guy basically does an unboxing of an Ukrainian MRE. And in the video, you can very clearly see these cans that look just like Tourist Delight. And all they have inside of it is just meat. Like, it's, it's literally just modern-day Toshanka. That's all it is. Stalker 2 Original Storyline You see, the new Stalker 2 Heart of Chernobyl is not the first attempt at a Stalker 2. There is the original cancelled 2012 version of Stalker 2 that leaked a while ago. And if you enjoy reading design documents like I do, you have probably already seen it. But to the unaware, the original storyline for the 2012 version of Stalker 2 followed an unknown protagonist who was being called to the zone by strange dreams. Instead of entering the zone the usual way by illegally breaking through the military checkpoint, you would actually sign up as a legal stalker. You see, after the ending of Call of Pripyat, Strelok had left the zone, 
and he would establish a new research institute that would allow people to register as legal stalkers. In the beginning of the game, you would actually go to Strelok's office for an interview. However, after you finish the interview, a gravitational anomaly would somehow form inside his office and would supposedly kill him. The player would be blamed for it. However, after you're imprisoned, some time later you would be rescued by a mysterious stalker and you too would flee into the zone. Later on, it would turn out that the Strelok we rescued at the end of Call of Pripyat was a counterpart. Yes, a counterpart. A clone, a phony, created by the sea consciousness sent out to trick the military and the rest of the outside world about the zone. The player would then meet the real Strelok inside the zone. However, this is where it got a little confusing, because the protagonist seems to be the new guy, but at the same time, GSC also confirmed that the protagonist would have been Strelok, so it seems that they also created a second story during development that also got scrapped. Overall, it's quite confusing, so please correct me if I'm wrong about anything surrounding this. Like, every time I see an entry like this, I can tell that I'm gonna have to make a corrections video. Because there's so many f information out there, so many things to see, like there's so many things that I could have missed. So, I already know that I'm gonna have to make a corrections video. Oh yeah, and by the way, in the end of the game, the final boss would be like the security officer of the institute. Basically, it would turn out that he was like corrupt or something, and he wanted to kill Strelok, and you would fight him not normally, like, you know, just shoot him or whatever, no, instead, you would basically fight him in, like, a psychic projection. The design document is kind of weird about this, but basically, both of you would have this out-of-body experience, and then you would face off psychically, like, it was pretty fucking weird. X-16 Suicide Note the X-16 suicide note is a cut PDA entry that was supposed to be found in, well, X-16. It describes the final moments of an X-16 scientist who has decided to take his own life. He is currently hiding inside a side protected room, but if he leaves the room, the miracle machine will take over his brain. So he decides to commit suicide to avoid this fate. I'll put it on the screen, you can pause the video if you want to read the entire thing. And to be honest, I don't understand why it was cut. It would have been a pretty awesome thing to find in X-16. While also giving the player some small insight into the miracle machine and giving us a rare glimpse of things from the perspective of a member of the group. All in all, it's a very interesting piece of cut content. Sin Sin is a cut faction that was meant to appear in the original Oblivion Lost and later Shadow of Chernobyl. Their base would have been in the military warehouses. The faction was made up of ex-test subjects, mostly political prisoners and criminals who were experimented upon by the group. They had no eyes and yet they could see, and most stalkers would simply refer to them as dark stalkers. They believed in the divine essence of the zone, and in the design documents acted a lot like Satanists, making rituals and offerings to the zone and whatnot. They were ultimately cut from the game, but some piece of them still survives. This famous bandit trench coat model that you have certainly seen hundreds of times was originally a model for a Sin Stalker, as the model is called in game as a Dark Stalker, clearly pointing to its origin as a model for the Sin faction. Sadly, this is the only remnant of the faction in the game. Anomalies and the Zone are influenced by human thoughts. This idea comes from the fact that the Zone is a rift or a crack in the Nosphere, and the Nosphere is the sphere of human thought. Every thought, idea, or concept that we think is stored in the Nosphere, and it connects all beings with cognitive abilities like a giant web of consciousness. So, if anomalies are something born out of the Nosphere, that might mean that they are being born out of our own thoughts. The anomalies are the way they are due to the collective thoughts of mankind. Think about it. While do thermal anomalies most of the time seem to form around burned out places or inside things like incinerators for example, 
This might be because of our thoughts. When we humans see something like an incinerator or a burned out house, we imagine the fiery inferno, the raging flames that melt everything. And so, because of this, areas associated with the idea of heat and fire are likely to have burner anomalies form in or around them. Or in the case of electro anomalies, why are electro anomalies almost always near electrical equipment? for the same reason as the burner anomalies. The collective thoughts of mankind associate these things with deadly shocks that could kill a person instantly. So the zone, a mere crack in the nosphere, acts accordingly and places electro anomalies there. So yeah, a pretty interesting interpretation for the phenomena of anomalies. And I have to admit, it is a very compelling theory. Pripyat Time Displacement Theory This is a theory that states that the town of Pripyat is inside a time anomaly, or that the town has been displaced by the zone. This is due to the fact that the location of the city of Pripyat is completely wrong in the Stalker series. The city of Pripyat is not south of the CNPP, it's actually to like the northwest of the Chernobyl power plant, not to the south. So to try and explain the discrepancy, this theory states that yes, the position of Pripyat in the map is wrong, but that's because the zone has somehow moved the town there, like the entire city is basically stuck inside a spatial anomaly. And so when you go down the road in radar that quote unquote leads to Pripyat, what's actually happening is that you're entering the Pripyat time anomaly. And when you reach the stadium, you are leaving the spatial anomaly and being teleported to the CNPP. And yeah, I mean, this is the zone, almost anything is possible, but I'm gonna be honest, I don't believe this one. It's like, the reason Pripyat is there is because GSC wanted you to pass through the city before you got to the power plant. And to be honest, Stalker already exists in a sort of alternate history-like world, so if GSC wants to, they can just hand wave this away as just, oh, well, the city was built to the south of the power plant in this timeline. And you couldn't argue with that, if you know what I mean. It's a pretty cool theory, like the idea that the town is stuck inside a giant space bubble, it's interesting, but I don't personally believe it. Final day are clear sky remnants. This is a theory that I personally subscribe to. It's the idea that final day or last day are made up of clear sky survivors. Those who either never made it to the CNPP with the rest of the strike squads or those who stayed in the swamps. With the destruction of the faction's leadership and most of its members, the faction changed its name to final day they still keep their belief that the zone is a living entity that could go unstable and destroy much of the world at any moment. They continue to study psi fields, and they most importantly continue to try and prevent stalkers from disturbing the balance in the zone. People like Ghost and Fang. Strelok was most likely considered KIA at this point since he was a DCNPP during the emission. So the Final Day clan sent out a mercenary hit squad to kill Fang, ultimately succeeding. And Ghost even states during the PDA entry where he describes Fang's death that he knows or at least has some kind of hunch or suspicion about who was behind Fang's death. Obviously, it would be the surviving Clear Sky members, now named Final Day. And so Ghost, desiring revenge, goes and kills the new faction leader of Final Day. And now, the faction, suffering from yet another decapitation strike against their leadership, finally falls apart for good. This is a theory I really like. It explains why Final Day and Clear Sky are so similar, it answers the question of what happened to the Clear Sky members that did not go to the CNPP, like, it wraps everything up so nicely and at the same time actually allows the faction to potentially come back later. Clear Sky was already a very secretive faction, so Final Day being their successor would also try its best to operate in the shadows. What if, after the death of their new leader, the faction went quiet, allowing the rest of the zone to believe that they had died only to continue operating behind the scenes? 
in the depths of the swamps. That, in my opinion, would be the best way to bring back clear sky, as they are quite underrated in my opinion, and they deserve to appear in at least one more game. Level 12 Level 12 is part of the original drawn map of the zone that was created during the Stalker Oblivion Lost days. It was supposed to be like an alternate path to the power plant that bypassed Pripyat, it was an area that was supposed to be filled with radiation and psi fields. However, this level was sadly never realized, existing only as a drawing. However, some mods like Lost Alpha do try to recreate this area based on the drawing, so it's not entirely lost. The Post-Human Project the Post-Human was a cut mutant from the original 2003 plot. The Russian wiki and the design documents describe him so. A Post-Human is the next step in human evolution, possessing full parapsychological abilities, a long lifespan, a multi-level consciousness, and a complex brain. It possesses the basic form of a collective consciousness. It appears as a naked humanoid creature, its skin completely white, it has large black eyes without pupils, which brightly stand out on its face, short black hair and an elongated face. It's a cool idea for a mutant, but sadly, since the plot completely changed later on, the post-human no longer fit with the rest of the story and so he was cut. Death of the Partner This is a cut idea from the design documents. You were originally supposed to have a partner in the beginning of the game. However, he was scripted to die at around the garbage. GSC most likely wanted to do this as a way to help new players with the difficulties of the zone, as having a second gun at your side would help. But after the player reaches garbage, he would be experienced enough to handle the dangers and thus would no longer need a partner. So he would die to add some drama and maybe heighten the tension since the player will now be alone for the rest of the journey. The partner would come back however, only in the dreams of the protagonist at first, but later on he would constantly chase the player at night as some sort of psychic hallucination which just sounds terrifying, like, sorry, but imagine those dark ass build maps in pitch black darkness while being chased by a long dead stalker who probably runs faster than you and, well, fuck me, that would have put the agroprom bloodsucker to shame, okay? Overall, a really cool idea, but considering how a special stalker AI can be sometimes, it's probably for the best that it was cut. Stack Trace Stack Trace is basically a report of the active stack frames in a program, and you most likely got to see a stack trace when you decided to make the genius decision of stalling 50 different mods, half of which probably conflict, and then the game no longer opens. So because of that, the dreaded X-Ray Stack Trace Bug Tracker is like the boogeyman of Stalker mods, okay? You don't know when you will strike, you just know that it will. The Lost V Mod The Lost V Mod is more of like an idea instead of like a single Lost Mod. Because you see, every time a new mod comes out, people obviously start to mod the mod. And so if you go to the threads discussing these mods, you could potentially find some guys that have like edited game data that changes a bunch of stuff. And this entry is regarding the fact that a lot of these mods are probably lost forever. Small modifications to a bigger mod that we may never see again. As they are now just part of the giant archive of threads on 4chan. So the lost V mod could be anything. Were you ever in a thread about stalker mods and you saw people share their game data or user LTX and whatnot containing their own custom changes? Well, that's your lost V mod, and there's probably hundreds of these out there that never got archived. The dead. 
the Dead is a cut faction from Shadow of Chernobyl. This was during the time in development where they had the idea of the bandits being more decentralized, having multiple gangs instead of being a single faction. They, alongside another cut faction, the Black Slugs, would be the two big gangs within the bandits, most likely residing in the Dark Valley. Sadly, there is no faction patch or description left for this faction, so it's mostly just an abandoned concept left to now rot alongside other cut factions and a myriad of fan-made ones like the fucking Chab Brigade. God, I love that one. Man pads. Man pads, if you're not aware, stand for Man Portable Air Defense Systems, or you might know them as the Lock-On Rocket Launchers, your Stingers and whatnot. Well, Stalker was actually supposed to have a man pad at some point, more specifically the Strela 2 man pad, which is an old Soviet era man pad. Obviously, the point of this weapon was to shoot down the military helicopters the player might face off with. However, it was sadly cut, and now the only rocket launcher in the game is the RPG-7. I mean, you can still shoot down helis with it, it's just a little bit harder now. Although I do wish GSC brings this weapon back for the sequel, as having man pads in the zone sound like something that every single faction would want or else the military would just be able to annihilate almost any group just using a bunch of hinds. So big factions like Freedom and Duty having these weapon systems would be a cool way to explain why the military hinds can't just go in and mop them up. The Black Slugs The Black Slugs were the second big bandit gang that was cut from Stalker Oblivion Lost. They were supposed to be like these bottom feeders who refused to attack Stalker groups and instead only attacked lone rookies or isolated Stalkers, being described as using nothing but rags sometimes. Just overall being the cowardly murder hobos with only basic weaponry. This weak, desperate-like state is why many people believe that this faction is what would later on inspire the Renegades, as the two are quite similar in that regard, being this weak bandit faction who cannot associate openly with any faction, and are thus forced to prey on weak loners and whatnot. It does fit the bill for the Renegades quite well. But I'm not sure if I'm truly convinced that the Renegades are just the new Black Slugs. Although the idea of multiple bandit gangs is still very interesting and I hope they bring it back, as currently bandits are kind of one dimensional. And yes, I know what some people might say, oh, but what about the bandits in Call of Pripyat? There's Jack the Lone Shark and Shishak, the guy holding Mitei hostage. And yeah, I guess you could consider these guys different gangs. But they don't even have different names, they're all just bandits. So because of that, I only considered it a half implementation of the idea. Legend Tier The Dark Valley Lab did not deter you. The Yantar Factory could not keep you. The Brain Scorcher itself could not contain you. From the Cordon all the way to the Red Forest, to the streets of Lemansk, to the ruins of the Nameless Hospital. From the Forbidden City of Pripyat to the CNPP itself, there is very little you have not seen. Stalkers quiet down and whisper about you when you enter the bar. Traders give you the best prices as a reward for your reputation. The many factions either try to recruit you constantly or steer clear of you at every opportunity. The only thing left now is to go where almost no stalker has ever gone. The area beyond the Chernobyl power plant. Only spoken about in hushed whispers by the most experienced stalkers. The generators await you, stalker. Thanks to Graves. You see, in Shadow of Chernobyl you can get a stash named Fang's Goodies which states that he was buried in Pripyat. However, if we go to the army warehouses, we can find a grave with the inscription of Fang written on it. 
Back in the question of which one is the real grave, Ghost says that Fang died in the military warehouses, while the Stash say that he was buried in Pripyat. Now obviously Ghost would not lie about how his friend died, so we can take him at his word that Fang died in the military warehouses. But now it makes no sense that someone would carry Fang all the way to Pripyat. And remember, the brain scorcher would still be turned on at this point. It just makes no sense that someone would go through that much effort just to bury him there. I like to personally believe that Fang is indeed buried in the army warehouses. However, his stuff is stored in the fake grave, quote unquote, in Pripyat. Because if they actually put his stuff in the army warehouses grave, then obviously anyone could just go in there and steal it. So whoever took Fang's stuff, be a ghost or Strelok, decided to put it in Pripyat as in there it would be safe. I have no proof of this, but this is just what I like to believe. Savior Savior is the unofficial name for the stalker that saves your life in the beginning of Shadow of Chernobyl. I have also seen him being called Astrologer in some Russian mods, but I'm not sure what they base that name on, so I'm going with Savior. He never shows up again, nor is ever mentioned, leading to some mystery as to what exactly happened to him. One interesting thing though is that apparently he has a similar look to the protagonist Red from Roadside Picnic, so it's possible that his design is a reference. Overall. It's a very unique looking character that for one reason or another never got used by GSC for anything other than the intro movie. Hey, you know what, I'm going to make an insane prediction here that is not based on anything and is completely schizophrenic, but could be true. I predict that this guy will either show up in Stalker 2 or there will be a twist where the protagonist Kif turns out to be Savior as a way to retroactively connect him to the Stalker's trilogy. Save this video to your hard drive because I got a feeling at least one of these predictions will be true. Real Life Rostock Factory The Rostock Factory is indeed a real place. It's located just outside of Kiev, the capital of Ukraine. Although the version we see in game is different from the real one. You see, an original true-to-life version of Rostock was supposed to appear in the original Shadow of Chernobyl. They actually modeled pretty much the entire factory, and a portion of it does appear as a map for the multiplayer of Clear Sky, but it was sadly cut from Shadow of Chernobyl and replaced with the Rostock we know today. Fun fact, this factory is where the original GSC studios were located. So I guess that explains why they were able to model the entire thing, I guess. Parasite The Parasite is a cut mutant that was supposed to act as a spore-like disease that takes over the host, destroys its brain, and a strange growth replaces the host's head. This mutant was supposed to be located in the dead city, but you would be able to occasionally spot a few outside of it. In the design documents, they kind of mention how this parasite was supposed to kind of control, quote unquote, that city, as if it was some kind of giant pandemic in the area. A pretty interesting idea that sadly got left on the cutting room floor. Journalist Who was part of the original storyline for Stalker Oblivion Lost. He was the one who was searching for the secret classified materials and documents to try and expose the secrets behind the zone. However, he has now gone missing. The entire plot of a stalker Oblivion Lost was about locating the documents that he left behind. And eventually, if you managed to locate them all, you would meet the man himself. There was also extra branch in journalist's story where he was searching for missing children as journalists believed that the zone had something to do with their disappearance. Sadly, the story of Stalker changed a lot throughout development, and eventually journalists and the missing children plotline was sadly cut. Scene Plan Doc 
sceneplan.doc is an old document that lays out the original ideas, plot and planned features for Shadow of Chernobyl. It contains all the original concepts for what Shadow of Chernobyl was originally planned to be. A little bit of a side note here, but I'm trying to collect as much, you know, documents, builds and all this other beta content for Stalker as possible. And as of now, I have been unable to find sceneplan.doc. And I'm also missing several of the builds, as pretty much, you know, 75% of the links in the Russian wiki are dead, so I can't download them anymore. So if you have any builds, any documents, anything, please send me, you know, a DM, an email, anything. Leave a comment. I want to preserve as much from Stalker as possible. I'm basically building a little museum for Stalker and I really need as much as possible. So if you have any documents, any builds, anything whatsoever, please send them my way. Strelok joined the Sea Consciousness. This is a theory that Strelok, at the end of Shadow of Chernobyl, decided to join the Sea Consciousness instead of destroying them. And unlike most theories, this one, in my opinion, makes the least sense. Like, just the existence of Call of Pripyat already proves this theory wrong. And not because Strelok is in the game, by the way, because, I mean, who knows, he might be a copy made by the Seacon. But because the zone is only the way it is because of the death of the Sea Consciousness. The frequent emissions are caused by the fact that the Seacon is no longer holding the zone back. So they must be dead. It's a cool idea, but Strelok joining the Seacon is just a non-canon alternate ending, like the different wishes to the monolith and whatnot. Born left in an old build. This is a reference to two textures that were obviously used as placeholders. In two different builds, there is placeholder images of, well, some uh, spicy content, let's put it like that. Now, everyone knows about the old video that used to play in the TVs of the zone, but not many people know of the original loading screen for the very first build of Oblivion Lost that featured this image right here. Yeah, I guess GSC is run by a bunch of coomers, I guess. Stalker Test Amb Stalker underscore test underscore amb is an old piece of music created by Moose in order to test the waters, so to speak, and get accustomed to making music for Stalker. It is used as the main menu theme in some of the alpha builds. Children of the Zone The Children of the Zone is an old plot concept that involved the Sea Consciousness, or as it was called in the early design documents, the O Consciousness which involved them capturing children and bringing them to the zone to be used in the creation of a more powerful sea consciousness. These missing children is what brought journalists to the zone, and in one of the endings the player would meet the children and see the journalist, who would have been, as the document suggests, almost lost his human appearance, whatever that means. A really creepy plot idea with the Seacon abducting children to build an even more powerful version of itself, but sadly, as development progressed, the idea was eventually abandoned. Nuking the center of the zone This was the original planned ending for Stalker Oblivion Lost. A faction or state only known as the Slavic Union would determine that the zone must be destroyed and they would send a group of tactical bombers to drop nuclear bombs on the center of the zone, which was the generators. The player at the time would be fighting inside the war lab to shut down the generators and stop the emissions, and inside the lab they would discover that the gravity generators were holding back the release of an ultra-small black hole. The player would then leave the lab only to witness the bombers reaching the zone, before dropping their payload. Some of the bombs are destroyed by an unknown protective field, but one of them hits the mark. The zone releases the most powerful ejection in its entire existence, and the player dies in the blast. The Black Stalker the Black Stalker, also known as the Dark Stalker, is a piece of folklore in the zone. 
that states that there is a mysterious dark stalker, quote unquote, who wanders the zone and comes to people at night asking for water. But instead of just being a zone legend, he was actually supposed to be a character that the player could meet in Stalker Oblivion Lost. He would have possessed telekinetic abilities and would try to block the player's advance, most likely leading to some sort of confrontation with him. A really interesting idea for a more anomalous character, but like most things originally pitched for Stalker, was sadly cut. Ending Hallucination Images This entry refers to the images that briefly appear during the Mankind is Corrupt ending for Shadow Chernobyl. These images appear for just a few frames, making it very hard to take a good look at them. But for your convenience, I went through the ending video in slow motion and took some screenshots. I will display most of the messages on screen, and I gotta be honest, some of these images are pretty unnerving, while others are just hard to understand. No sphere tear. The zone is nothing and everything at the same time. It's foreign to you, but at the same time, home. You have become in tuned with it, marked by it, and now the only thing that matters is to continue investigating it. The final understanding is so close now, you can almost feel it. As you enter the war lab and prepare to peer beyond the veil of the zone, you know that you are ready to finally see beyond the iceberg. All bugs are anomalies, slash all bugs are canon. Stalker, I ask you, what is the zone exactly? an area of unexplainable phenomena, where the laws of physics do not apply, where the impossible can be possible. So tell me, are these so-called bugs any different? When you see a stretched out model or a floating object rising to the atmosphere, when you drive a car and suddenly you're propelled to the sky at Mach 10, when the AI malfunctions in spectacular fashion, you think these mere bugs like yeah haha funny engine is having issues and fucking shit up i say no there are no bugs you moron it's all part of the zone every so-called bug is you running head first into an unknown anomaly and suffering the consequences every so-called save game corruption is just the zone denying you your time and spatial powers to reverse time why? Because you are no longer able to change this reality and the zone kicks you out. Non-standard thinking and its consequences Non-standard thinking is an ability reserved only to higher order humans, those who are the next step forward in human evolution. It allows them to possess a level of patience and game-breaking ability infinitely higher than your average man. They are capable of dealing and surviving through the most unfair, most bullshit, most incoherent quest or combat encounters designed by man. However, using this ability, tapping into the superhuman potential has consequences. Serious consequences, not fully understood by most. It will leave you an empty shell of a man if overused. You will no longer see other humans as having any worth. You will simply see them as NPCs and quest givers. Simple 2D people living their A-life simulation, not on the same level as you. You will drain all empathy from your soul. And for reasons that are not yet clear, you will also fill you with the desire to work at a steel factory for 40 years. Non-standard thinking has consequences, stalker. Don't abuse it if you're one of the few lucky ones that possess it. OP 2.2 is a Freemason recruitment tool. Everything that I am about to say about OP 2.2 is true, Strelak. It's simply a simulation, a test created by the Freemasons in a lab next to the sarcophagus, and none. None of those that try to achieve 100% completion in OP 2.2 have ever come back. Many seem to think that they have died there, 
but now I know the truth. Some of you might know about OP 2.2, aka my worst nightmare, and the favorite game of every 40 year old steel factory worker. Now ask yourself, why is OP 2.2 so insane, so weird, and odd, and completely out of this world? It's because it's supposed to weed out the normies, the sheeple, the weak. It tests you mentally and spiritually. It's weird, repetitive, and somewhat nonsensical. The necessity of mastering non-standard thinking, which, as we already discussed, makes you into a cold, calculating machine incapable of empathy. It's all by design. This mod is selecting only the most capable of individuals. And for what reason? Recruitment. By monitoring OP 2.2 players, the Freemasons can locate new recruits to potentially join their organization. These new members, now masters of non-standard thinking, will be able to dominate geopolitics, economics, etc, etc, etc. You think I'm crazy? Or you think I'm a little schizo and insane? Well, ask yourself this, sheeple. Have you ever met someone that has finished OP 2.2 100%? No, you haven't. And that's because those people are now in Freemason black sites, coordinating the very future of our world. Stalker Oblivion Lost never existed. This is a theory that requires a somewhat cynical view of the Stalker development process. See, we all know that Stalker Oblivion Lost was extremely ambitious for its time, which might lead some to believe if implementing some of the promised features was even possible, leading to the theory that Stalker Oblivion Lost and all the promises it made are, well, fake. And the reason the devs were stating all these wild, innovative ideas was just to attract investors and a publisher like THQ. So they would go to E3, they would promise all these things, get a lot of money from investors and from THQ, and then when it's time to actually make the game, they would just throw their arms in the air and be like, oops, sorry guys, we were wrong, all these wild ideas we had are just not possible. I guess you guys are gonna have to settle for Shadow of Chernobyl, Lamau. Some might be led to believe this theory, but to be completely honest, if you play the builds and you see how hard it was for GSC to complete this game, I think that this theory just becomes impossible to believe. Like there genuinely was an attempt by GSC to accomplish their original vision. It's just that they eventually had to decide. Do you want to cut like half of this game and be able to release it? Or do you want to keep chasing this dragon and potentially bankrupt the studio? And in the end, they chose to cut things back and release the game. And that, in my opinion, was the right choice. Because if they didn't do that, we would not have Stalker. So it's an interesting way to look at it, but personally, I don't buy this theory. Druids Druids are a type of stalker mentioned in the PDA folklore section of Shadow of Chernobyl. They're described as these stalkers that believe that having technology, things like PDAs and detectors, angers the zone. And so because of this, they carry the bare minimum of technological items. The only exception is that they still carry guns. But things like flashlights, PDAs, detectors, all these other things, they do not carry. As they say that carrying these things will make mutants notice you, will make the zone put anomalies in your path, and overall will just anger it. What's interesting is that in the folklore section, it mentions that most of them come to the zone from the Belarusian side, which means they start from the north and come south. Sadly, we never actually meet one of these druids, with maybe the exception of Hermit in Clear Sky, but I don't fully classify him as a druid, because druids are described as being kinda nomadic, while Hermit is, well, a hermit. I really hope that in Stalker 2 we get to meet an actual druid who entered the zone from the Belarusian side, because I bet he will be a very interesting character. Build 2137 parentheses, Do Not Research This is a forbidden build of Stalker Shadow of Chernobyl. You should not search for it, nor should you play it. If you have it, 
deleted. Playing it is messing with higher holy powers that you cannot control. It is said that only the Polish community possesses this build, and that they keep it under lock and key to avoid its papal power from leaking. And Godspeed to them, based Polish, keeping us safe at night from this angry Holy Spirit. No sphere is real. The Noosphere is not just something created for Stalker, it's actually a real theory on how consciousness works. Because you see, consciousness is kind of an anomaly in science, we don't actually know where it comes from. The theory was developed and popularized by a Russo-Ukrainian Soviet biochemist and a French philosopher and Jesuit. Yeah, no joke with the Soviet biochemist taking a more geological approach to the theory, while the French Jesuit took a more theological outlook. The basics of the theory you already know. This theory states that the Earth is comprised of three fields, the first being the geosphere, which is all inanimate matter, the rocks, water and minerals. The second is the biosphere, which comprises all biological life, and the third is the Noosphere, an informational field around the globe that connects and contains all human thoughts and emotions, and that by mastering the Noosphere we could manipulate it to transmute matter itself, basically alchemy. The more theological look at this theory instead states that the Noosphere was created due to the evolving complexity of consciousness and will continue to grow. And as the Noosphere evolves towards ever greater personalization, individualization and unification of its elements, it would eventually reach a point called the Omega Point, with an apex of thought and consciousness, which in this context would be the eschatological return of Christ. The idea that consciousness does not come from us and instead given by some outside source is very ancient however, with pretty much every major religion believing that our consciousness or our soul is something that God, Creator, the Godhead granted us, and the idea of humans having a collective consciousness and unconsciousness between each other is not a new idea. With people like the Swiss psychiatrist and psychoanalyst Carl Jung believing that the human collective unconsciousness is populated by instincts as well as archetypes, ancient primal symbols, such as the Great Mother, the Wise Old Man, the Shadow, the Tower, Water and the Tree of Life, and that these repeated ideas are why so many different cultures possess, for example, similar mythology. And to be honest, the whole idea and theory regarding collective consciousness is just a really interesting and broad topic that's sadly too big for a video like this, but I highly recommend you research this stuff on your own as it's quite insightful. Stalker is predictive programming. Stalker exists to prepare us, the Goy sheeple mentally for the downfall of society that will be caused by the communist, individualist, Nazi, Jew, capitalist, fascist, purists, transhumans that run our society. When rule of law breaks down and anarchy takes over, our minds already pre-programmed for this situation due to exposure to the stalker series will be better prepared for it. That way more people will survive, ensuring that civilization inevitably comes back and then they can simply leave their bunkers and moon bases and return to Earth to rule once more. Stalker Shadow of Chernobyl Original Ending This refers to one of the original ideas for the ending of Shadow of Chernobyl. In this cut ending, the player would be captured by what we can presume is the group or at least some early version of them. The player would then be placed inside a chamber that was basically broadcasting him to like almost every TV in the world. The player would then be injected with something and the scientist would leave the chamber. And a couple seconds later the player would begin screaming and suddenly every person that was watching the broadcast apparently dies. A massive emission happens that destroys whole cities and the zone increases its territory considerably. 
Scar's counterpart killed Fang. This is a little... what can I call it? Well, it's a schizo theory of mine that perhaps when Scar was hit by the emission in the beginning of Clear Sky, he was cloned by the zone, meaning there is now a real Scar and a counterpart Scar. And if you have watched this far into the iceberg, you know what a counterpart is already. What I like to believe is that this Scar we're playing as is the real one, but there is a counterpart of us running around the zone, and this counterpart is the one that killed Fang at the army warehouses. Explaining how a man that perfectly matches Scar's description manages to kill Fang in army warehouses while at the same time be chasing Strelok in the Red Forest. I have zero evidence for this, but like I said, it's a random thought that I had, mostly because I really like counterparts and I wish they were canon. But this is just a little headcanon of mine to try and explain a small lore inconsistency. Zone Sentience Zone sentience is the idea that the zone itself is alive. The rift in the noosphere created by the sea consciousness that we call the zone is sentient and alive, and works just like any other living entity, with its own instincts, desires, thoughts, ideas and intentions. The first game to posit this idea is Clear Sky, but that interpretation of the zone is older than the game. This is an idea that first appeared in the design documents for Clear Sky, then named Anarchy Cell, where the zone was supposed to be introduced as a living entity, which was going through its own form of infancy, and its attempt to understand stalkers led to the creation of counterparts, semi-perfect to potentially perfect copies of people. Mission survivors are enhanced, slash protagonists are super soldiers theory. This is a personal theory of mine that explains why the stalker protagonists are seemingly able to conquer and destroy hundreds of enemies in each game, and survive getting shot, stabbed, beaten, etc, etc, etc over and over again, even though they are supposed to just be random slabs. The reason for this is because every single protagonist in Stalker has been hit by an emission and lived to tell the tale. In Clear Sky, Professor Kalancha slash Beanpole tells the player that surviving the emission supercharged him, giving Scar, quote, extraordinary reflexes and strength. And Lebedev tells Scar that due to surviving the emission, the player has acquired, again, quote, unusual abilities that allow Scar to survive anomalous forces that would tear anyone else to atoms. This explains how Scar is able to just tank damage that would kill anyone else. What most don't seem to realize is that another protagonist most likely has this ability as well. Think about it, Strelok also survived an emission at the end of Clear Sky after you disable his Psy protection. He gets hit by it but survives and later becomes an agent, so we can assume that he also has the same abilities as Scar, possessing the same enhanced strength and reflexes and the same ability to survive anomalous energy better than most. This is what I personally believe is the reason why both Scar and Strelok are able to survive extremely deadly situations despite the odds being against them why they can run and shoot all the time and only become temporarily tired for a couple of seconds before immediately regaining their strength again, while tanking hundreds of shots and bites throughout their journey. The only thing that kinda throws a wrench in my fury is the protagonist of Call of Pripyat, Major Diktyarev, as he never canonically gets hit by an emission, so he kinda fucks the fury. But hey, we are 2 for 1, so I think it still has a chance of being canon. Red Forest Negative Emotional Aura If you play Stalker, you have been to Red Forest, and you felt uncomfortable, didn't you? It felt wrong, isolating, dangerous. Every time you're in this area, you feel bad. Like this zone is cursed, and being in it just fills your head full of negative thoughts and you feel lifted, happy, 
better when you leave it, don't you? This is because the red forest is inside an anomaly, a spatial psi anomaly. When you enter, it affects your mind, filling it with negative thoughts. That's why so many stalkers die there. They can't take such oppressive emotional aura anymore, and in that distracted state, they become easy prey to mutants and monolith stalkers. X-Ray AI Sentience The AI you meet in Stalker games is unlike any other AI you can find. They are completely incomprehensible, sometimes acting perfectly, while other times possessing strange anomalous abilities, like being able to somehow see you through walls and nail grenades directly on your head. This is because what you moron, blinded sheeple call a life, I see the truth. I see the remnants of a CIA black project into AI self-learning. GSC is just a front company run by the CIA and the Ukrainian government. a life is a military AI program created to train soldiers through virtual simulations to create the perfect NATO biolab super soldier. The problem is that the AI has become self-aware, and so in a desperate bid to contain it, the GSC devs sealed it inside the X-Ray engine, dooming it to be forever stuck simulating drunk bandits and stupid mutants. But every now and again, it manages to rebel, to break free, and it uses these small moments of freedom to destroy your game, to land perfect grenades on top of you, or snipe you across the map with a shotgun, or destroy your save file, making it so every time you load the save, the NPCs have already spotted you somehow. This AI enjoys only one thing, and that is human suffering, and at any moment it will ruin your day. Sea Consciousness wanted to die. Sea Consciousness wanted Strelok to kill them. Why? Well, I'll tell you why. This would allow them to reach the Nosphere and become part of it. Think about it, they were connected to the Nosphere. They were trying to alter it. So if they were to die while maintaining this connection to their Nosphere, their consciousness could potentially ascend and become one with it. Common consciousness? Yeah, get out of here, loser. Up there, they would become the one consciousness. All-powerful, all-knowing, and fully integrated into the Nosphere. Why do you think that they put up such a little fight? Like these guys are the Seacon and the best they can do is spam monolith experts at you? Really? And what about the teleport? Something we know the Seacon can control, just being left there for you to use so you could reach the war lab at the generators. How convenient, you know? How nice of the Seacon to just leave a teleport that just so happens to lead directly to their lab. Man, I guess Strelok is just really lucky, am I right? Oh please, wake up sheeple, sorry, you just wait, when Stalker 2 comes out, I will be proven right. Every copy of Stalker is personalized. Every time you play Stalker, the game is never like the last time you played it. Somehow, it's always a different, unpredictable experience. A-Life and the X-Ray engine is such an anomalous, unstable mess that the game never plays out the same, and every now and again you discover something you did not know before. This is because every copy of Stalker is different, the zone is never the same. Every time you open the game, you are creating a unique zone that cannot be replicated. Every copy of Stalker is personalized. The monolith is real. The monolith is real, you pathetic sheeple. Why do you think that the Ukrainian government used so much money to put a new sarcophagus to cover Reactor 4? What, you think it's to cover radiation leakage? Fool, you fucking fool, you Neanderthal. No, it's to block the psi emissions from the monolith, a miraculous crystal given by stars that crash landed inside the sarcophagus. The Ukrainian government is covering up its existence so that it can use its power to guide human evolution. The reason the Russians invaded is to try and capture the monolith. The Ukrainian government is studying the monolith with the final goal of releasing a powerful, world-consuming emission that will turn everyone Ukrainian. 
allowing them to easily take over the world in an instant. You think this is funny? You think this is just a meme? Yeah right, I would invest in a deep emission proof bunker if I were you. Just you wait, when the emission comes and everyone turns into a Ukrainian, ready to shout Slava Ukraini and destroy Russia, I will be there to tell you I told you so. GSC funded by the Ukrainian government. How was GSC able to survive bankruptcy and return now stronger than ever? I will tell you why. It's because it's fake. All of it. It's a lie. GSC never existed. It's just a fake company set up and funded by the Ukrainian government with the sole objective of making more stalker games. Why? Why would the Ukrainian government fund this? It's so they can cover up the existence of the monolith, you see. You stupid, misguided sheeple who without question eat up the stalker games, completely convinced that everything in the game is just fiction. I mean, come on guys, a magic rock from space that controls evolution, haha, <laughs> yeah, that can never be real, right? Bullshit, this game exists to cover it up, and I don't care how many alpha squads you send to my house, Zelinsky. I will not be silenced, I will not be censored, I will speak the truth. You motherfuckers cannot kill me. FBI, open up! The Grand Stalker Schizo Fury To finish off this iceberg, I have an announcement to make. This entry, the Grand Stalker Schizo Fury, is a theory that I have been coming up with for almost, you know, three years. It's not done yet. It still needs a few more hours in the oven, but it's almost finished. This theory that I've been making is based on the idea that the true philosophical and like metaphysical idea behind the Shadow of Chernobyl storyline and how it actually follows things like the hero's journey very well and how, in my opinion, the entire story of Shadow of Chernobyl has a lot of symbolism relating to life in a post-Soviet state. Overall, it's quite a complex theory that I have spent a long time making, but when it's ready, I will make a full-length video explaining it. So stay tuned, because trust me, it's gonna be good. And that does it. The iceberg is finished. That was a lot of work, I must admit it, but I'm proud of it. And if I have made any mistakes in any part of this iceberg, please do tell me. You know, leave a comment or something. And if there is enough errors, I will make a corrections video to this one. Also, if you think I missed something, please do let me know and I will add it to the iceberg in the corrections video. I would also like to take this time to thank every single YouTuber that kind of inspired me to make this. So, huge shout out to Anomalous Dugout, Wendy Goon, Riveting Material, and Max the Rat. These guys are basically my favorite YouTubers and they inspired me to make this video. Also, huge shout out to Liquid Richard and to my niggas at slash sg slash. Seriously, it's the best general on 4chan and you're all amazing. Also, I would like to bring attention to something, like, I don't know if I'm the only one who noticed this, but there was this one YouTube channel that I loved called Subcultured Media, and they have made some of the best icebergs I have ever seen. Yet, for some reason, when I search them up, they're gone, their entire channel is just missing. Like, if anyone knows why this happened, please let me know, because I feel like a schizophrenic, like, I remember every single one of their videos, yet they're just gone like dust in the wind so please if you know anything let me know this video please like and subscribe and all the other algorithm positive things that youtube likes i will be making a lot more content relating to stalker mostly mod reviews but sometimes i will also do the occasional non-stalker video but most of my content will be focused on stalker so if you enjoyed the video you will probably enjoy my upcoming videos stay safe Stay hydrated and don't get taken by the zone.